on. There it's on again. It's on. The red light. Let's try that one. Oh, it's the purple button, is it? Yeah. Not the pink button. There we go. Good evening, everyone. I'll start over. It's uh, One Sound City Council, December 17th. It's now 7 p.m. <coughs> Wish to uh, report out of our closed session. Council started at uh, 6 p.m. with a closed session. We had a closed... Oh, so right there in the first sentence. We had a closed session meeting this evening beginning at 6 p.m. Council reviewed the closed session of council meeting held on November 19th, 2018. Council reviewed one matter regarding a personal matter about identifiable individuals respecting the appointments of public members to boards and committees and providing direction to staff. And council reviewed one matter regarding labor relations or employee negotiations respecting an employment contract and providing direction to staff. Down to uh, number four on, on our agenda, which is a call for additional business. Anyone else tonight? Councillor Thomas? Yes, Your Worship, I'll have a question for staff regarding the uh, current proposal regarding parking and the DIA in the downtown core. Thank you. Others? Seeing none, I'll have uh, a year-end statement. Oh, staff, I'm supposed to go to you first. I think I'd know after four years. Disclosure of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Uh, Deputy Mayor Wright. <laughs> Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Thank you, Worship. I have a pecuniary interest in item 12I regarding a wedding at Mudtown Station as they own shares in the restaurant. Also in the community services minutes, I declared a pecuniary interest in item 8A1 regarding the Harrison Park Inn lease agreement uh, due to my investment in another restaurant. Thank you, others. God. Thank you, Worship. I'll be declaring a uh, conflict of interest on item 12D due to my employment. Good. Thank you. Others? Good. Number six, confirmation of council meeting. 6A. Yep. Moved by myself, seconded by uh, Councillor Grieg, that minutes of the inaugural council meeting held on December 3rd, 2018, as printed, be adopted. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. 6B. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thomas, that the minutes of the special council meeting held on December 5th, 2018, as printed, be adopted. Thank you. All in favor? That is carried. And one more. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Tanning, that the minutes of the special council meeting held on December 6th, 2018, as printed, be adopted. Sorry, I'm go ahead. You can help us out. I I'm not hearing you. Oh, so there's a fourth one. Okay, sorry. All in favor? Carried. Now I believe you have a fourth one. Then. Yep. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Kepke, that the minutes of the closed session of council meeting held on November 19th, 2018, as printed, be adopted. All in favor? That is carried. So that gets us through confirmation of council minutes. <laughs> Number seven, motion to move council into committee of the whole. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Kepke, uh, that City Council now move into Committee of the Whole to consider public meetings, deputations, and presentations, public question period, matters arising from correspondence, reports of City staff, consent agenda, committee minutes, matters postponed, motions of which notice was previously given, previously given, and additional business. Thank you. All in favor? That is carried. So we are now in Committee of the Whole. We're at number eight on the agenda. Uh, we have no public meetings, deputations, there are no deputations or presentations tonight, public question period, if there's anyone with a public question, I'll get you to step up to the microphone and uh, push the button, state who you are, what municipality you live in, and ask your question. <clears throat> I'll get you to push the button there, Ted, just, I think. Hello, Ted Stewart, Owen Sound. Um, it's a question about communication on the city's website uh, to le give an email to mayor or councillors. Um, you can do that, but it leaves no trace on my computer, so there's no record 
of what I sent out so I can refer to it later. And I'm just thinking that uh, I guess the question would be, could we have a system that, uh, that leaves a, um, a record of uh, my communication uh, that I've sent out to, um, to the city? You're going to have to uh, come to a microphone, I think. If uh, maybe you can grab Pam's chair there and microphone. Yeah, Sean Hilliker, manager of IT. I I can speak to that. So yes, you are correct. When you put in an email, fill in the box, it goes directly to the counselor, and no copy goes to yourself. I will speak to our website provider to see if they can actually send a copy to uh, to yourself or whoever uh, submitting the email. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Peter Reed, Owen Sound. Unless the DIA has been holding some secret meetings again, uh, neither set of uh, minutes that are being presented tonight uh, have been approved. And in my experience, that's uh, very unusual to publish minutes from unconfirmed meetings or unapproved minutes. In fact, the DIA has always refused to provide me with information from the minutes until they have been approved. I'll also note they have not released the minutes from the closed meeting regarding my letter that the Ombudsman concluded was improper. Perhaps they only do it when it suits their agenda. Uh, but Peter, uh, those things have been recognized and uh, we'll be dealing with those tonight. Okay. Now I've got a points, couple of questions regarding... Making, yeah, the points you're making we're, have been acknowledged. Okay. Um, under the draft MOU, uh, who's paying for the marketing and promotion pl uh, plan? Because uh, after budget for parking, flowers, and events, there's no money left over. Okay, so that's a question for the DAA. That's uh, a draft that council is not looking at okay. tonight. We're not making a decision on it. We'll look at it at some point in budget time. Okay. It's not, not before us. We're not prepared to answer at this point. Okay. Um, in the DIA's minutes they're pre presenting tonight, um, they're saying they're paying for the parking on First Avenue West, which is outside the DIA's mandated area. Would that be even be legal? I wouldn't have an answer for you. Anyone else? There's been no legal opinion uh, okay. obtained here. Your, your okay, and the parking plan uh, may guarantee turnover or tickets to those who have businesses on the street parking lots, but will cause consequences to those like those on 10th Street East, who depend on the lots. This will create an unlevel playing field. Will council insist on uniform and consistent parking policy in the downtown? Thank you. Point made, thanks. Anyone else with a public question? Welcome, Ray. Uh, my name is Ray Botton from Owen Sound. Um, tonight, I, I, I feel that there was a, a possibly a disservice, not purposely, just because the agenda tonight regarding the uh, decision that will happen regarding the retail cannabis stores here. Um, I did want to have a, a presentation, but because it's it's so quickly being moved forward, I can only do it at, during question period. So I'm kind of putting it together that way. Um, my concern, uh, being an outreach worker and also understanding firsthand, firsthand the needs of the city, those who are falling through the cracks every night, uh, to have a uh, uh, an open forum of of uh, legal sub now a legal substance, uh, probably in the downtown core would be uh, detrimental to the overall. Uh, situation and my question is does council understand each individual each councillor and our deputy may mayor and our mayor do you understand by making the decision tonight it is far more reaching for years to come once we opt in and if we opt in which I believe we can take our time my question is, do the council understand that even our grandchildren from now, our great-grandchildren, 
will be affected by this decision tonight. Thank you for your question. We'll have the report that is coming later from staff. As you're aware, the decision has been made at the federal government that allows uh, your children over 19 to be able to um, uh, imbibe, use, however you want to use it, uh, no matter what we do on the streets of Owen Sound. No, but, but it's the question tonight that I believe uh, I understand was that uh, there will be a decision tonight regarding the retail stores. Correct. And we have the option that the federal government has uh, carte blanche. We can, we can smoke as much as we want. But we, as a municipality, understand that we can actually uh, not be moved by money and be moved by compassion and possibly even a referendum. I don't know. But for sure, the decision is going to be made from local council, from my understanding, tonight. So my question is, are you aware that this is much far more reaching than just a decision to have someone make money downtown? We're, we're dealing with uh, years and years down the road that this decision to allow people to have the, uh, the availability to be able to uh, purchase their marijuana uh, at any time and I still say that the consensus within the city because I'm just beginning on this outside with my signs I believe the consensus is that, that the more people would be concerned about having a decision tonight in favor of having the shops open I think if there was a referendum, I think it would be defeated. I don't want to take any more time. Th th thank you for your question. You will hear uh, the opinions of all the councillors before the night is over, I'm sure, on it. And uh, you're right, it's complicated, extremely complicated. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you wish to uh, step to the microphone, get you to push the button, state your name, and uh, ask your question. Welcome. Hello, welcome, Mayor. I'm Michael McFadden. I've got Michael's Marijuana Store downtown now. Since the two months that I've been open, there's been a huge amount of people coming in wanting to buy marijuana. I tell them, no, I'm not selling marijuana. But the, I think the long-term risk is if we don't have stores downtown or anywhere in Owen Sound, people are gonna drive and they're gonna buy marijuana outside of Owen Sound. They're gonna smoke it and drive back. Okay. And that's a danger I'm, I'm for gonna, us. Gonna and then cut you off just a little bit in that it's supposed to be a question, okay. not a chance for a public meeting well, to have a discussion. I wanted to rebuttal. Yeah, yeah, you, you made okay. your point. Yeah. So that's my point. And the other thing is, I feel that it's not bad for us and the seniors of this town that are coming. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Number 11, correspondence received for which direction of council is required. Uh, 11A. We have a, um, so we can speak to it, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, staff has met to discuss the potential of such a program. Currently, there is a textile diversion program in place in Owen Sound with the Salvation Army, Value Village, and at least one other of the missions who have been set up throughout town to receive uh, used garments. You may have already noticed an ad on CTV highlighting the relationship between Value Village and Di Diabetes Canada. Staff does have some concerns uh, regarding the projections that was contained in the letter of 700,000 kilograms being able to be di diverted within Owen Sound. And based on our own research, we have found that the, in the City of London, they collect annually about 200 pounds, with 11 bins located in the, at arenas within the City of London. London's population is 394,000 with a service in metropolitan area of close to 500,000, which is much larger in our area. And we're talking about numbers that are essentially four times greater than, than what is currently being collected in London. That's what's presented in the letter. Uh, another concern is that these bins are set up at our facilities. If these bins are set up at our facilities, we don't want them to become dumping grounds and that we would expect them to be kept in a <coughs> tidy and clean uh, kept up tidy and clean. So what we're saying is we will definitely approach the Mr. Langer to explore this initiative in greater detail before coming back to council with any initiatives. Okay, so 
What are we doing with the correspondence? Councilor Thomas. Motion to receive. Okay. Further discussion? Councilor Kapke. Thank you, Worship. Um, through you to the director, uh, individuals can now call the Diabetes Association and have articles picked up at their home. Is that not correct? Go ahead. Um, thank you, through your worship. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I know Valley Village does have their, their containers set up, as does the Salvation Army. Call the question then to uh, receive. All in favor? That is carried. 11B is correspondence from uh, Carl Sider with regard to drinking water source protection. This is where we can, uh, with along with uh, Saugeen, uh, Gray Sobel, North Bruce Peninsula, we can appoint one person. So we potentially can appoint one. Each of those municipalities can appoint one. No. And then they choose from that list. Go ahead. Through your worship, we can put forward a name, but um, they only select one from all of those all areas. Of those, yeah. Or we could get together with all these municipalities and together appoint one if we want to do it that way. Is there anyone that has any interest in being on uh, source water protection? Or any thoughts on how we manage this? Go ahead. Just a question, Your Worship. Is Bill Twaddle not there uh, as the chair? Yes, but not as an Not as our representative, no, Correct. but he is an Owen Sound individual. Thank you. Okay, so you've got the correspondence here. What do you want to do with it? Council Greg? I was just going to, uh, my interpretation on that was that it did not necessarily have to be a municipal official that we could solicit a public member. Go ahead. Through your worship, I've contacted the project manager and they've indicated that they prefer it to either be a council member or a staff member. Okay. Go ahead. There has been a staff man member who has indicated that if council is not interested, they would take, they would put their name forward. Want to do that? What do you, let's give some directions here. Councilor Greg. Well, I, I like that idea. I think it's good to have somebody that's involved with it. It takes me back just about four years ago when they brought out the new EBA events based um, literature and, and recommendations as to what you could and couldn't do and at that time it's just about um, restricted salt and similar materials on our inner harbor and, and we took action and, and were able to get some uh, revisements made to that initial draft and it was critical at the time so I think it's so you're excellent putting, we've got someone you're that putting up your hand saying I'd be interested in sitting on it uh, well, I, I, was, I was happy to hear we had a staff individual that would be interested. Um, but I do have the time too. So. Maybe we just table it and uh, do a little more consulting or reviewing the staff. Dennis, any ideas? Uh, just the idea that I was the one that was interested in. Yeah. <laughs> oh. There we go. I'd certainly like to move that we put Dennis onto that. We recommend Dennis for this position. All in favor? Carried. Perfect, thank you. Correspondence from Paul McQueen, Secretary of Gray County uh, Farm Safety Association. This comes out annually or every four years. We get the uh, invitation if we want to appoint a member to the, to the um, Gray County Farm Safety Association. Councilor Greg? Just a motion to receive. Uh, we don't have an individual uh, I don't think we need to appoint to that committee. Okay, all in favor? That's carried, thank you. Down to number 12, reports. So the first one is a recreational cannabis retail stores uh, report. Thank you, Your Worship. The purpose of this report is really to provide some background regarding the provincial and federal regulatory environment, to also provide information on the funding through the Ontario Ministry of Finance, and then um, lastly, to provide consideration of a municipal cannabis policy statement. So through Bill C-45, the federal government legalized access to recreational cannabis in Canada. The federal government regulates cultivation and processing, they license producers, and those are the only legal growers of marijuana. 
Under federal regulations, they leave it to the provinces to establish regulations for the sale and use of recreational cannabis. The government has indicated three main goals in legalizing access to cannabis. That is to protect youth, to improve public health and safety, and end illegal sales of cannabis. In Ontario, from when it became legal October 17th to April of 2019, um, Cannabis is available online through the Ontario Cannabis Store. Beginning in April, we will begin to see private re retail stores that are licensed only by AGCO. I shared with Council uh, a bulletin that was provided today. Um, the provincial regulatory environment seems fairly fluid and we understand based on that that applications will begin uh, to be received in January. There will be only 25 stores in the first round those stores, there'll be seven in the West Region and Own Sound falls within the rest West Region and there will be no stores in municipalities where there's less than 50,000 people which would exclude Own Sound in the first round. Through the AGCO, there is a three-part licensing regime for the retail operator, the retail site location, and then lastly, for the store manager. The stores are licensed on a two-year basis and then can have a renewal of two or four years. Once an application has been received by the AGCO, they provide municipalities uh, through their website a commenting window. Um, the AGCO will receive comments um, based on a, a fairly narrow definition and um, it's up to the AGCO whether or not they uh, would, would consider those comments. The Ontario regulation provides that municipalities cannot enact bylaws uh, to regulate cannabis stores through zoning or under the Municipal Act to license these uh, through a business licensing process. So in terms of standards for pre private retail sales. Um, the standards are attached as we understand them, but there are several regulatory uh, requirements um, around the physical store and security. In terms of uh, the municipality, there is a one-time opt-out. If the municipality has opt in, opted in, you cannot then opt out in the future. If a municipality does opt out, you can at a later date opt in, however it's not clear how it may impact your funding. The decision to opt in must or out must be made prior to January 22nd um, and sent to the registrar in writing. If this doesn't happen, um, the, the municipality is deemed to have opted in. In making your decision, Council may consider that recreational cannabis is now a legal, controlled, and regulated product in Canada. It is available online. There is an ongoing list on the website um, of municipalities that have opted in and out. There is an opportunity through the licensing process through the AGCO for public input. Retail stores will pay taxes and provide employment. It is a highly regulated environment. <clears throat> the consumption of marijuana is governed by the Smoke Free Ontario Act uh, with public health doing the enforcement. Council in the report is provided with two options. One is an opt-in resolution and the second is an opt-out resolution. Moving on to financial support, the letter from Vic Fideli, Ontario Finance Minister, is attached. There is funding to assist municipalities with increased costs related to the legalization of cannabis. In the first round, there's $15 million available, and that would, is multiplied by the number of households in Own Sound by a factor of $127.50, so almost $13,000 in funding. In the second phase, um, after the Jan that would be provided early in January. Following that, an opt-out municipality would receive $5,000, and then we understand um, the second round of funding would be similar to the first for the opt-in municipalities. If Ontario's portion of the federal excise tax on cannabis over the first year, two years exceeds $100 million, the province has uh, indicated they will provide a 
50% share of the surplus to municipalities who have opted in before January 22nd. AMO has uh, suggested that municipal councils consider a municipal cannabis policy statement. The purpose would be to set out specific and locally sensitive considerations or uses to represent the expectations of this community in allowing cannabis retail stores here in Own Sound. Um, there is no regulatory requirement for the AGCO to act on the information. However, it's considered to be a proactive step. A municipal cannabis policy statement would help identify local sensitive uses. So we've created a map and the first one shows in red the areas where a retail store is a permitted use and those are areas where a cannabis store would be permitted. The second map uh, shows in blue the locations of schools as well as a 150 meter mandatory buffer from those schools uh, where a retail cannabis store would not be permitted. The third layer shows in red or the, the overlay between the red and the blue. Next we have um, what staff have identified as sensitive land uses. These include things like daycares, churches, drinking establishments, addiction treatment facilities, the existing beer and liquor stores, as well as group homes. And we've applied a 70 meter sup setback to those uh, uses. Then we see the overlay with the, um, the retail stores. And then the last map is a, it shows the schools, the sensitive uses, and then the retail stores. So the areas um, essentially that remain red would be eligible for cannabis outlet uh, stores. If council chooses to opt in, staff could bring back this policy for consideration and approval in January. Once approved, it would be uh, sent to the AGCO and really help uh, create the city's comments on future licensing applications. <clears throat> in terms of communication strategy, this is something that council may wish to consult further with the, uh, with the public regarding. The recommendation, Your Worship, is then in consideration of this report that you would provide direction on the notice re for the registrar prior to January 22nd and then also provide direction with respect to the draft municipal cannabis policy statement. Good. Discussion. I think this is one of these things that every councillor has a uh, point of view on, so I'm going to start on one end and go to the other, and I'll get you to state your uh, position of principle, left to right, right to left, and might as well start with Councillor Thomas. I'm looking his way. He's sitting next to Pam, so we just keep going in the right direction. Thanks, Your Worship. I'm in favor of opting in, and I'm in favor of that for a couple of reasons. You know, it was uh, Mark Twain who said that the prohibition of a thing is what makes it precious. And I think at Owen Sound, we spent 66 years trying to prohibit the sale and consumption of alcohol, and it was a magnificent failure. And I think we've learned that lesson, and I think it's uh, pretty pointless to go back there again. From a personal standpoint, I have uh, three young adults, uh, all of whom have uh, been born and raised in Owen Sound, and with at least two of the three, we have certainly seen the seamy underbelly of the drug culture in Owen Sound firsthand. And I, as a parent, you know, I didn't object to uh, marijuana smoking per se, but my great fear as a parent was always that my children would get some marijuana that was adulterated with something. And I think we really need to take a stand here to stamp out that illegal sale of marijuana in this community. And uh, if you don't think it's happening within 50 feet of the front doors of this building we're sitting in here right now, maybe even closer, you're very much mistaken. I think that uh, it's the law of the land. I think that uh, people are already smoking it and they'll continue smoking it. And I think it would be pointless for us as a council to try and, uh, to try and prohibit things. From a political standpoint, uh, you know, everything in this city turns based on money. Everything we do as a council is based on money. And I think if there is a new revenue source there for us through taxation, I think that we have to step forward and grab it. 
And I personally believe that uh, this would be an excellent kickoff to some further downtown revitalization. So I am definitely in favor of opting in, Your Worship. Thank you. Councilor Greg. Thanks, Mayor Body. I think I have a few different, uh, or a little bit different perspective than Councilor Thomas, but uh, at the end of the day, I, I see us going the same direction. Um, you know, one of the greatest, I am, I'll, I'll just say this, I couldn't be more prouder than to have two high school kids who, who live a healthy lifestyle and don't do drugs. Um, and it's a great start into their life. Um, but I'm somebody, it doesn't matter if I go out for a run super early in the morning or in the middle of the afternoon or in the evening in this town, I, it leaves me, my head, I'm scratching my head as to the number of people that, that consume marijuana and, it's, and it doesn't matter where. And just the other night I was walking home through the mill dam at, you know, probably Wednesday or Thursday evening at six o'clock and I'm coming up behind a guy walking out just smoking weed. Um, it's not the way I would choose to live my life, but I understand it's in the community. It's so prevalent. I understand how available it is under this system where it's online. And from a business perspective, it's like no other business. If they go into business, they're gonna to have to be good at the business or they're gonna find that they're gonna fail at potentially a rate similar to other businesses, which could be one third fail rate, could be seven tenths of a fail rate when they get this, this opened up. I don't know if I go into business and just you know, open my doors and, and provide du Maurier's, I'm not sure how long I would be in business. Uh, so I think at this time, the answer is to opt in. Um, I think there is some ancillary charges that we're going to incur and to refuse any additional funds uh, to combat or to support the social, the increased social need uh, and any additional costs the city has, I don't think it makes sense. So I would vote with Councillor Thomas in favor of opting in. Thank you. Councillor Merton. I would also agree to opt in. Being a healthcare professional, I am of mixed feelings. I know the benefits that some medication can give for medical use, but I also have seen what happens in addictions and what happens to the social aspects of a community, a family, and individuals through addiction. This is a decision that reminds me of a Solomon-like decision. How do you make lemonade out of lemons? We didn't get the choice initially to legalize or not legalize. That decision was made for us. We do have a decision now. I believe at this point in time, however, we don't have enough information to be able to make an informed decision. We don't know what the long-term impacts are going to be of recreational cannabis. We don't know down the line, decades later, if we're going to be seeing the health, same health-related concerns that we see now from people who started smoking cigarettes. There's a lot of unknowns, and so we really are on a very, very dangerous cliff. My concern, and the reason that I'm saying opt-in, is because I see what happens to people who buy the drugs in the back corners, laced with things we do not know, who overdose and who die. A life is worth regulation. And for regulation alone, for those who make choices, then they will know that they will get a quality product that is not tainted and could kill them. For that reason, I opt in. Thank you. Councillor Dodd. Thank you, Worship. Um, I think it's fair to say that our, our exposures are going to be present whether retail is approved or not. Um, the federal government has allowed and the provincial government have allowed for this product to be uh, um, purchased, whether it was online or on personal growth. So, um, and that's not even including the black market side of this. So the exposure that of marijuana is out there and isn't present in the, in the public. So 
Um, whether we approve retail or not, it's not going to not just not be an Owen Sound. One, the black market usage is still going to be there. Two, you'll be ordering it online if you're going to use it. And three, you would be uh, growing it yourself. So even if we said no, we weren't going to opt into this, um, the exposures of marijuana are still going to be in uh, the city. So the, the retail offer or the retail storefront actually offers as uh, some of my previous counselors have stated, of both a safe and secure source for purchase, or purchasers being provided uh, by the government. There's no worry that what's being grown with what it may potentially be laced with. And let's not forget this is actually the law of the land. The rest of my life, the rest of uh, most of the lives here in, in, in this room, this will be a legal substance. Um, this is a, a, a product that can be purchased on the internet and the government is okay with it. Um, so there's no difference between cigarettes, marijuana, alcohol, prescription medication in the eyes of the government. So I think that's the, the thing we all need to remember. They are all equal. Uh, we may have these social um, views of marijuana from our past experiences or from it being illegal for so many years, but according to the law of the land, this is now, this has the same, um, is the same view as other currently legal products that you can purchase at uh, the LCBO, and currently what the province is looking at, so you can buy it out of a grocery store, or, well, you can buy it at a grocery store, um, or your cigarettes that you can buy at every corner store. Um, let's not forget also there's going to be in increased expenses, whether or not uh, we opt in or opt out, because once again, those exposures are still going to be present, whether it is through online sales or personal growth. For policing, all of a sudden we have a, a capital expense increase, because now we're doing more breathalyzers and the other parts of that go along with that part. By law enforcement, because now this is a legal product, it's not going to be a, the police officer who goes and takes that complaint that someone is smoking a joint in the backyard. It is going to be a bylaw officer who will be taking that on. So increased operating expenses on that. We're going to take a look at increased fire budgets. Let's not forget, if you are growing and you have personalized uh, growth opportunities in, in your home, there are other things that come along with that. Mildew, mold, all the other aspects of things that if it's not done properly. If it's done in a, a, a garage or in your, in your closet and it's not done that properly, there's other exposures that are that come along with that. So where does that uh, increased operating cost come from? Come from the taxpayer. So if these expenses are going to happen, whether or not we opt in or not. So it's up to us to decide what kind of revenue source we're going to look at it from. We are going to have an increased expense, both on capital and operating. And if we're going to opt out of it, then who's going to take on that tax burden? It's going to be the ratepayer. There's no other option for it. That's where it's going to go to. So one, opting in, it's going to help put money back into the local economy by putting in, filling in some vacant storefronts. Hopefully it's going to put in some rejuvenation of baby tourism. And once again, I'll say this again, there's no difference between what is going on currently between a, a marijuana facility and what's going on a winery, brewery, or anything else. So all of a sudden there, there's a new option for tourism opportunities. That Everyone goes on a winery tour, everyone goes on these different things to see these different parts because it's a new age, that's a, a, the cool thing to go, do, go do a brewery tour. But there are these other options of what things are going to happen. And, I, and whether or not we like it, the federal and provincial government has made this legal. Um, so once again, I would state that one, it's putting money back into the local economy. It's going to help with vacant storefronts. It's making sure that a, a drug that is not being laced in the black market or grown improperly, that can hurt someone. Um, and it's already legal. And our expenses are already currently there. So it's up to council, so I would be opting in. Thank you. Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Thank you, Worship. I'll try not to repeat. Um, one other point I had was the, uh, we have a developer right now that's applied for a license for a medical marijuana plant in Owen Sound. If that comes to fruition, that would be a huge boost to our economy. And I think if we opted out, we'd be sending the wrong message to that developer for sure. The other point I wanted to make was back in the 50s, I'm guessing, when Owen Sound was dry, everybody found their booze through the bootlegger. And now we've got these beautiful, well-run beer stores. They're clean. We have a clean LCBO, legal and well-run. And the best of my knowledge, the bootleggers are gone. So it's my hope that we opt in and have clean, well-run legal stores, which will destroy the black market and keep the marijuana out of the hands of our children. Those are my points. Thanks. Councillor Tamming. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Markham said not yet. Mississauga said not yet. I believe it was last week that Georgian Bluff said not yet. Georgian Bluffs decided that my understanding on the basis of a very powerful uh, public health 
message that was delivered by one of the counselors. I keep asking myself, what is the rush? We've been doing without this stuff for about 150 years, and I think we can wait. I must say, reviewing the agenda, I was extremely disappointed in the public health unit, and I spoke to them over the weekend. They've chosen to sit on the fence with this, and I am really puzzled. Ray, I wasn't going to say this, um, but uh, I appreciated your comments at the beginning of the meeting. I found them very powerful and eloquent. And I want you to know that all of us have experiences, I believe, with children or with friends or with the drug culture. It's not a foreign thing to anybody who lives in Owen Sound. My own experience is of a very young tenant whose mind was not completely developed because he was under the age of 25. And uh, he developed schizophrenia purely as a result of long-term use of marijuana. And uh, he's no longer with us. These are real situations on the ground. And I personally believe uh, that the trend of the federal government and so forth, it's law, I get it, but there's been a trivialization of drug use that I regret. Uh, I notice as well, we don't, have a, we don't have a police report. I understand that you consulted with the police. I'm disappointed the police didn't get back to us. My discussions with police tell me anecdotally that very little of the sketchy and dangerous activity that happens at uh, 9th and 2nd involves marijuana. You're dealing with many more illicit drugs and many more scary illicit drugs. Uh, we have no evidence before us. We're simply taking this at face value that this is going to flush out some sort of black market that exists in this town and that all of a sudden you'll be able to walk downtown and uh, all this sketchy activity on the street corners will be gone. Uh, we have no evidence in, in support of that at all. But I'm very disappointed in the public health unit. Uh, they have spent 20 years making lepers out of smokers. They led the drive on that. They uh, were very hard on a man who sold the wrong kind of milk. And yet when it comes to this issue, our local public health unit just sits on the fence, crickets, and they don't make a decision one way or the other. I oppose the sale of weed in the downtown core. My good friend Richard Thomas uh, says that this is prohibition all over again. And I respect our local historian, but I would disagree. The analogy does not fly. During Prohibition, it was illegal to manufacture or sell alcohol. But under our current laws, there is no such ban. Anyone can go online and order the stuff. During Prohibition, it was illegal to make your own booze. Thus, we had moonshiners. But under the current law, you can have your own private still. You can make your own moonshine. Four plants. Four nice, big plants. I asked my counselors, and I am surprised, I'm a rookie counselor, I did not realize we're all just going to state our positions. Um, I'd like to think we're a parliament that can debate things. And so I'm holding an open mind, I'm going to listen to everybody, and even though I have these views, I'm going to make a considered vote. So I'm hoping to persuade some of the, uh, I guess all of the counselors to my left. And I simply want to urge us to wait. Why not do what Mississauga did in Georgian Bluffs and monitor how things go in the places that opt in? After all, here's what we don't know. We don't know how many stores the AGCO will permit in our town. We do know that we will have absolutely zero say in where those stores are located. And with all respect to Madam Director, and I think she would agree with this, this is purely the town telling Toronto or wherever the AGCO is located, what we'd like. They have absolutely no obligation to listen to anything we say. So we don't know how many stores uh, that they will permit. We don't know how large the check will be from Ontario other than it's really a relatively minuscule 13 grand. We don't know, again, if the stores will flush out the underground market. We don't know if any of the people on the street corners will in fact go away. We just don't know. We don't have data. There are no guesses. And so why the rush? In view of all this uncertainty, some very prominent municipalities, Mississauga among them, voted no. This is a one-way valve. Opt in and you're stuck with it forever. Opt out and we can take our time to see how things roll out. I'm urging the council essentially to delay this vote. That's what it would be. I know technically we would vote to opt out. That's my preference. But let's adjourn the issue, so to speak, till 2022. 
let's wait a few years and check out Kitchener, London, wherever. And let's see if the underground sales have in fact been smoked out. And let's see if in fact we are allowed ridiculous amounts of stores in the downtown cores. We know nothing of this right now. I will say in conclusion that if pot sales, if pot stores, and if the sale of pot is the salvation of our community and the salvation of our downtown core, we're in a pretty, pretty sorry state. Those are my submissions. <clears throat> Thank you. Councillor Kepke. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, recreational marijuana, recreational cannabis, by giving it the name cannabis, does it make it a different product? Not. Opting in or opting out is a difficult decision for me. Um, I've been trying hard to learn all about this topic since its legalization, and I realize it's a substance that's being governed and legislated. Um, there are measures in place to protect the health and safety of individuals, although I'd like to hear, as my fellow colleague said, directly from the health unit. Um, there's strict licensing in place for sales of cannabis products and products containing cannabis. Um, licensing of the individuals that sell those products. And I realize we should not stand in the way of business. Government funding has been put in place to support the licensing and enforcement of this product. However, I am deeply concerned about the vulnerable individuals. Will they include this in their cost of living? Will food and shelter costs suffer? Will the cost of their family needs suffer? I only speak from experience. I agree that control of this substance is better than not, and people will find it anywhere, um, just as they have been doing for many, many years. It's just very difficult, personally, for me to endorse this. Thank you. Councillor uh, Hamley. Um, it, as Councillor Kepke has said, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, I see what each of my colleagues have said, and I, I understand that, what they have all mentioned. Um, but I do have some questions for the Director of Community Services, if that's possible. Yep, please go ahead. Um, would you say it's safe to say that uh, the province's uh, regulations are still shifting somewhat at the moment? Through you, Your Worship. <clears throat> um, staff attended a webinar, I believe, on Thursday, and each time there is additional information on the regulatory regime and the licensing, certainly we have provided that to council, but I would say it's kind of a fluid environment, yes. Okay. Um, and then second, uh, would you agree that we do have time to undergo some form of public survey? Through you, Your Worship, that's up to council. Okay. Um, if it's okay with you, Your Worship, I'm going to use my uh, my time on the at the end of the docket to uh, move a motion. Okay. Okay. Um, I would move well, that. I, I I will speak after okay. that. There. Then we'll look for motions, and then we'll okay, have the ahead. discussion yeah. about that motion. So if you're if you're moving now, then hold on. But if you're okay. But if you are you done otherwise? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. As mayor of a city of Owen Sound, I'm um, angry that this is before us. We had a federal government, um, a newly elected uh, federal Liberal Party, Trudeau, that was in a hurry to rush this through. There was a deadline set uh, that it was going to be legal. There's been no regulation set for police to know how they're supposed to, uh, how they're supposed to measure sobriety, how they're supposed to test it with equipment. They're still not ready. The province isn't ready. Every time we uh, open the news or open uh, emails in the last three days, we've got new information. Now there's only going to be 25 stores given out in Ontario. There's only going to be seven in the Western region, which I think probably takes in London to Windsor to Chatham to to uh, Sarnia to uh, and um, and you must have more than 50,000 people. That's today's news. This was very poorly thought out and put onto our plates. And here you go, uh, municipalities. You decide now whether you want to retail. We're going to sell from the province. We're going to sell marijuana online, whether you like it or not. It's coming to your community, whether you like it or not. Uh, you're going to be dealing with all the issues, like it or not, the social issues, the, uh, the uh, driving issues, the policing issues, uh, housing issues. Um, all those things that go with it are coming, whether you like it or not, because um, you know, the upper tiers have decided that. 
they've given us a deadline of January 22nd to decide if we want to opt in or out to get the uh, the money. That's a, Councillor Tamming has indicated it's a pretty small little baby carrot, but it's still a carrot. We don't know going forward if we opt out now and opt back in later, will we be eligible for money? There's been some hint that we wouldn't be, that we wouldn't get that money if we, uh, if we wait. Um, if we opt in now and we get the small carrots they're going to throw to us, will that last forever or will the uh, provincial government start grabbing that money and, uh, and using it to pay down provincial debt, which Lord knows there's a lot of provincial debt over the last number of years. Will we continue to get money to help us? Will it be enough money? We don't know. But the same point, we're running into cost no matter what we do. So do we opt in, allow some stores? They have to be, we know they have to be allowed where uh, retail is allowed with the exception of uh, within 150 meters of schools. And let's hope that our uh, submissions, uh, when we do make a submission, if we make a submission, um, allows us to um, pick out some other areas such as churches, such as uh, treatment centers, etc., that uh, we have some buffers around those. Will those buffers really make any difference? Probably not. Would the buffer, if we build a fence around on some, would it make any difference? We all know it's not going to. It's coming. It's here. It's legalized. That's not our choice. That was decided at the federal government. That's not our choice. We're getting it. Whether we like it or whether we don't, it's coming. We will have the cost of issues. Um, in my mind, we're better to opt in and try and get the money that's coming and hope that it continues to come uh, and expands versus not opting in and getting all the issues anyway without the, uh, without the help. So I reluctantly say that I'd be uh, opting in, opting in, not really happy about that, but uh, the lesser of two evils, I think that would be uh, my vote. So any other questions for staff? Actually, no, I'm going to go to Brock if he wants to make a motion first. Yeah. Uh, so I just think we don't need to make this decision tonight. I, I really believe that we do need to have some form of public input before we are able to make a decision. Um, and so I'm going to move that council direct city staff to undertake a public survey reporting back at the January 7th council meeting and that our decision to opt in or out of Ontario Regulation 468-18 be deferred to that same meeting. So asking for it to come back January 7th. Staff, does that allow enough time? Our next meeting after that would be the... Too late. No. Yes. Too late? In time, but we have to send a letter within three days of the decision. Okay. So I'm looking to staff whether uh, 7th or 20th. First, would be more appropriate from your point of view to do a survey. I, I think, your, your Worship, we'd certainly try to do it by the seventh. Give you time to debate it on the seventh, if that's Council's wish. Okay, thank you. So it stands. Discussion to that um, to that uh, motion, Councillor Merton. A few things about the survey. It was discussed that it would be an online survey potentially, and my concern is around those who have disabilities or are not have access to online services. I think to be equally accessible to invite input, I would request that we um, explore other mediums in addition, whether that's um, telephone interviews or other ways to obtain input because it does disadvantage some uh, from having the opportunity to express. I agree with the concept of additional input. There's a couple of other um, groups that I would really like to hear from. I'd like to hear from the police department on what, what is it going to do? What are the anticipated impacts and costs? As I said earlier, we don't have enough information to make an informed decision. And we also need to hear from the public health unit. Uh, this is such an important decision. For, for a long time, that we're being asked to make a big decision without that input. And I'm wondering, even if we have to call a special meeting of council, which my first really official meeting, and I'm asking for a special meeting, not sure that's a good idea, but this is too critical not to give 
give the content and the intent to make a wise, the wisest of decisions. So just piggybacking onto you, Brock. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. I won't be supporting the motion, Your Worship. I think that uh, we've just been through a major referendum here in Owen Sound, which was called the municipal election. Uh, this subject came up quite often during the municipal election. It was reported on widely. We stated our positions, the community knew our positions, and here we are elected to council. I think what our community is looking for from us is some leadership on this issue. Uh, my concern with the idea of a survey is we're heading right down the same slope that Owen Sound headed down in 1905 when it uh, opted uh, out of legal alcohol sales. And, and, you know, I understand, you know, I'm here, I'm going back to 1905 again. I can see your look, Councillor Tamming. But at the end of the day, that action divided this community for 66 years. And that is not a division that I personally am willing to open back up in this community. We are here for a reason. We were elected to take leadership, and it's time to take that leadership. Councillor Gregg? I too won't support the motion. The reason is, while I, I'm not happy about it, like the, the mayor very well eloquently spoke, um, it's hard to convey the amount of information that we have before us in what is, is a very well written report. And I would uh, mention too, it, you, the staff have done an excellent job providing council with the updates as this has been going along. So I, I feel like what you, you, the survey that you put out there can be very simplistic and it can just uh, draw a very, almost an unknowledgeable or an uneducated um, or uninformed. That would be the, the best term, would be an uninformed decision. Because if I didn't have this information, I don't want it in the community, personally. But when you go through the data and the information that we've got, and, and you're reading about how you're, we're precluded from making zoning <coughs> amendments because of what our wishes are, and, and the government says you can't do that. You have to treat it like any other business. Um, I feel it's very hard to convey that kind of message, that, that information in survey. So I, I don't think my decision will change now to the seventh, so. Just if I may uh, butt in, uh, Ms. Coulter, is there not, is there not some limit in what we can do in a survey? Or are we wide open? Through you, Your Worship, I'm not aware of any restrictions that you would have in a survey. Okay, I, th I thought I, there were specific <clears throat> questions that. I had recommended um, to you in the, um, the staff report that if council wants a to develop a, a retail cannabis policy statement that it would be very helpful. Staff have done our best to identify sensitive land uses, but there are things that we probably aren't aware of or don't know about, and making those maps available both online and perhaps here um, would be an opportunity to ensure that we've identified and reflected what the public considers our sensitive uses. Okay, thank you. Looking this way, was there anyone else that had? Councillor, Deputy Mayor, Larry. I just wanted to, uh, I have to agree with Councillor Thomas on this. Uh, we just had an election and Councillor Hamley, uh, I don't mean this is a slam, but with all due respect, you led the league. You knocked on 6,000 doors. I can't possibly think in a survey between December 20th and January 6th that you're going to talk to enough people to change your mind. I know I'm not. I won't support the motion. Else, go ahead. Yeah, just in response to that, I, yep. I, uh, I very clearly stated my position at the all candidates debate. Um, I probably, in all likelihood, will vote for the motion, but I also said very clearly that there needs to be some form of public input. Uh, and I think going forward, without that as an official city document, I, I don't think that that's, uh, you know, that's not doing a good job as a council. So. The last word uh, by the movers, I'm going to call the question, which is to uh, delay this and ask for a survey to come back on January 7th. All in favor? Two. Opposed? So that is defeated. Councillor Thomas. Your Worship, I would move that in consideration of the legalization of recreational cannabis by the federal government, Bill C-45, 
and the Ontario Cannabis License Act and Ontario Regulation 468.18, Council requests the City Clerk notify the AGCO Registrar that the City of Owen Sound has chosen to opt in to the retail sales of recreational cannabis. Discussion? I think we've discussed the daylights out of it, eh? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Opposed? One. So that is carried. Down to uh, 12 B in our agenda, which is uh, boards and committees housekeeping. Through you, Your Worship. Each year, City Council selects the boards and committees they wish to serve on and considers public appointments to boards and committees based on vacancies and terms of service that are expiring. Tonight's report begins the process wherein Council has provided general information and asked for direction where necessary. First, staff wish to inform Council of the updated format of the board and committee bylaw the draft of which is attached to the report. Staff have reworked the structure of the bylaw to improve readability. Major changes include a new order of sections, clarification of rules, and integrated appointment information within the body as opposed to the use of schedules. The final version of the bylaw would be presented for approval in January once all new appointments have been made. Second, staff are recommending the dissolution of the City Hall Accommodations Ad Hoc Committee. As an ad hoc committee, the committee served a purpose of a limited nature. Now that City Hall renovations are complete and staff has been relocated back to City Hall, the committee's mandate is deemed to have been met and any future information related to City Hall accommodations can be brought to Council. Third, the Tom Thompson Art Gallery Advisory Committee has advised that in order to access more potential funding opportunities, some funding agencies are requiring a reduction in Council members as sitting members of the committee. In response, staff are recommending the number of Council members appointed be reduced to two from three and that the number of public members be increased to six from five. Fourth, the Owen Sound Downtown Improvement Area Board of Management has requested an extension of their currently appointed public board members to April 1st, 2019 to coincide with the election of a new board following their annual general meeting scheduled for mid to late March. Staff recommend the extension to ensure continuity of the board. Fifth, the Owen Sound Municipal Nonprofit Housing Corporation and Owen Sound Housing Company have requested a reduction in the number of appointed council members to their boards from two to one. This is in recognition of the fact their governing bylaw still only requires one council member and it was a temporary request at the time of 2014 for additional council representation as several developments were in progress. Staff recommend the change as an appropriate return to normal practice. Lastly, staff are recommending a change to budget dates as listed in the 2019 council and committee calendar. To accommodate the county's budget dates, staff recommend the city hold its budget dates on January 15th, 22nd, and 23rd, 2019 respectively. That, Your Worship, we'd be happy to answer any questions Council may have. Thank you, Deputy. This is going to get—it's uh, going to be hard not to call you Deputy Mayor right every time. You can call me whatever you want. To Your Worship, to uh, uh, Ms. Coulter, or, do we not have one more ad hoc meeting with City Hall? Through Your Worship, I'm not aware of a requirement to have an additional meeting. Did you have a agenda item in mind? <coughs> Yeah, like a wrap-up, but I but that'll just go right to council then. Yes, there would be a financial wrap-up as part of the uh, director of corporate services year-end report, but I don't think there would be a need for a committee meeting unless the committee wanted one additional meeting before you finished. No, that's fine. Thank you. Other questions, for Mr. Law? Go ahead. I just wonder on two things: uh, do are we continuing? There was some discussion about the Tom. Thompson um, and making it six at a later point or is this um, recognize that okay and secondly I have uh, an amendment to the draft boards and committees bylaw which would be that item 40 be revised to recognize the appointment of two councillors to the Gray Sauble Conservation Authority uh, all the other municipalities put, con put councillors as their members. Owen Sound did for many years and then um, had the good fortune of Mr. Dick Hidma, who served as a private uh, appointee, but uh, he's now retired and I see it um, reasonable to, to go back to two councillors. Uh, other municipalities do appoint individuals for four-year terms. I'm totally open to it doesn't have to be a four year we could do two years um, but two councillors to a two year term to 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 see how that starts okay. 
Okay, so Councilor Gregg, is, uh, right the, before I'm going to come back to you for the motion uh, with the amendment, but before we get there, so with regard to uh, Grace Hubble Conservation Authority, right now we're appointing uh, two members for one year each. Is there a uh, desire to go to a different length term? Councilor Kepke. I would agree with the councillor that a two-year term, similar to what is done with Police Services Board, would be more beneficial. Okay. Others? Discussion? Ideas? Thoughts? I'm going to come back. Oh, Councillor Thomas? I'll just say that if the standard for other municipalities is a four-year term, I would suspect that uh, the Gray Sobel Conservation Authority has a reason for that. I mean, certainly a number of years ago, we changed uh, the requirements for the Library Board to a four-year appointment. Uh, just to uh, allow for continuity over the duration of a term of council. And I'm just wondering if that might be part of the reason behind four years. And I could certainly support uh, the four-year term if that's the standard that, that other municipalities are adhering to. Other, do you want to reply? Go ahead. It is the standard that other municipalities use, and they appoint councillors only. Councillor Greg, make your motion. Yeah, I'll make the motion. Uh, that uh, in line with the recommendation and consideration staff report 18 128 respecting 19 boards and committees housekeeping city council one dissolves city hall accommodations ad hoc committee two amends the tom thompson Air gallery advisory committee composition to two council members and six public authorizes the extension of the own sound downtown improvement area board of management appointments till march 31st 2018 reduces council appointments in the own sound municipal nonprofit housing corporation and the own sound housing company from two to one and approves the amended budget meeting dates as outlined in the report and amends the item 40 in the draft boards and committees bylaw to two councillors to a four-year term with Grace Sable Conservation Authority. Now, Councilor Greg, I missed a couple of things there. Okay, can you repeat that? <laughs> Just kidding. You've got it? Okay, everyone understands? So, Councilor Kepke? Just further to that, Your Worship, um, the DIA that you're mentioning it's not the current councillors terms that are being extended is that correct it's only the public members and um, in that case several years ago the DIA board had only one council member and then increased it to two I wonder if it's beneficial that they have more of um, more downtown people on that board as opposed to council positions just a question and the other thing I wanted to um, add is I'd like to see that council be notified of meetings where council has a financial interest in committees those being the community waterfront heritage um, active lifestyle center Billy Bishop board festival of northern lights so that we as council can attend those meetings and if we have an interest in them we wouldn't be voting members but you know we may have an interest in just seeing how things are going with them so that things don't get offline. No, I, I know what you're saying. Is this the uh, document to say it in? And if I'm sure the clerk would appreciate having clear direction when they are amending the bylaws. Oh, I'm sure they would. <laughs> Bite my tongue. Um, it seems to me that we have to pass these so we can get going on the new year, and otherwise we'd be uh, trying to table it to get to work in all the bugs that are coming up. Councillor Thomas. I just wonder whether we need to have anything official in the motion regarding those uh, granting organizations or whether we can just send forward a request from the clerk's office asking them to notify the city council, city staff, when they have meetings. <coughs> that would be satisfactory to me. So we're back to uh, the, the motion that uh, went by uh, almost too quickly for me to hear. So my other question was the appointment of two council members, two DIA, or one council member. Discussion? Please. Do you think it's something we can leave till the, to the DIA board to make their recommendation? However, it I makes do. it difficult when we make our selections next meeting, whether it be two or one. I, I don't see Councilor Greg uh, rushing to uh, amend his motion that he's already made, so it's up to you. You know, in considering the what's before the DIA and before City Council in the next year, I, I, it's 
may be fine to leave it at, for another year as two counselors. I, I don't see any harm with that. Okay, so I'm going to call the question. All in favor? That is carried. Uh, we're down to 12C, human resources, with regard to non-union wage increases 2019-2020. Ms. Allen. Thank you, Your Worship. This report is received by council generally annually or biannually, and we are seeking council's approval for a non-union wage increase of 1.5% for the 2019 year and 2020 year. Um, we historically have aimed to mirror what is decided through union negotiations for both our QP inside and outside unions. Both of those unions have settled at 1.5% up to the end of 2020. The, the cost of this implementation would be $75,000 in 2019 and slightly higher than that in 2020. Thank you. Discussion? Councillor Dodd? Thank you, Worship. I'll just move the recommendation. Okay. Any questions? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. 12D, community planner, site plan approval for 9th Avenue East. Thank you, Worship. This is an application for site plan approval by Richard Graham on behalf of Sound Lifestyles Limited for a 19-unit townhouse development. Mr. Graham and his team are here this evening. The property is a two and a half acre site on the north side, north of 23rd Street and west of 9th Avenue East. Um, the property, if the clerk would just go to page two of the report, is sort of irregular in shape and there is some question as to the small strip that extends towards 23rd Street and it you'll see as a condition of site plan approval we're just looking for some information that would clarify um, the ownership of that property as it's important to the servicing. So the proposal is for a life lease development. Um, as I mentioned, there would be 19 new townhouse units in six buildings on the site. That each unit would have its own driveway and garage. All units would be barrier free, which is um, beyond the requirements of the building code, certainly, and the developer is to be commended for that. There would be a private internal road. The, the road would be um, private, maintained by the developer, and it would have uh, a gate. There's a clubhouse on the property as well as a stormwater management uh, pond. Significant amount of supporting documentation was submitted with the application including site plans, stormwater management, servicing feasibility studies as well as the landscaping plan. In terms of the provincial policy statement, proposed, this proposed infill development having access to full municipal services. Um, ac access to transit certainly supports the type of efficient, cost-effective development within an urban municipality envisioned by the PPS for the development of strong communities. Our official plan designates the property residential. It's within the East Bluffs planning area and it's designated medium density residential. Townhouses are permitted use within the designation. The uh, proposal addresses the infilling policies of the official plan. Staff recommendations strive to recognize the developer's intent or vision while also carrying out the direction of the city's policies which represent uh, the vision for the city and council's contract with the community for how Own Sound will grow. Normally we try to um, resolve all issues during pre-consultation but in this case there are two issues um, that remain following pre-consultation. The first, if we could go to um, then the next page, page seven of the report, is the throat gave gate and internal driveway. As I noted, the um, 19 units are on a private roadway. There are several official plan policies that provide direction with respect to um, access, minimizing danger for vehicles and pedestrians. <clears throat> In terms of the throat width, which is the area where the curbs come off of 9th Avenue and they begin to turn into this development, the city's engineering standards would require a 7.5 meter throat. So there's conditions that would recommend uh, this modification to the site plan. You'll then see that the, the development narrows in an area where the proposed gate is. And while um, staff don't have any objection to the gate, the gate does function so that the operation is on the left-hand side. So if you're pulling into the development, um, either making a left or right turn, 
the person entering uh, does have a short time where they would conflict with someone coming out of the development. Given the, um, the number of units, probably not a significant development. It is important, however, to meet the city's engineering standards and to function uh, as a fire route that that gate be six meters in width. Um, lastly is a safe pedestrian route. As I mentioned, the um, internal drive provides access to those 19 units and it functions much like a, a local street, although in this case it will be maintained by the developer. The official plan requires for a local street sidewalk on one side of a local road. And the official plan, um, even on private property, when speaking to private parking lots, the official plan emphasizes that pedestrians should have safe, well-lit, clear routes from vehicles to buildings at all times. The urban design requirements of our official plan speak to securing a safe and accessible pedestrian environment. The health unit, our accessibility advisory committee in the County of Gray, all encourage providing a safe route for pedestrians. Staff are recommending a 1.5 meter uh, curb face sidewalk on at least one side and parallel to the private internal uh, driveway to increase safety and accessibility uh, for pedestrians on, on this site. In terms of the zoning bylaw, the site is zoned R3 and subject to the conditions, sorry, uh, which permits townhouse dwellings and subject to the conditions recommended, particularly with respect to accessible parking, um, the site can achieve the uh, site and building requirements for that R3 zone. In terms of landscaping, the site will be attractively landscaped. Uh, there'll be entrance pillars, there'll be 31 new trees planted, and there'll be some existing fences and, and uh, hedges maintained to uh, ensure uh, privacy. There is one area where the, the road dead ends at the stormwater management pond where it may create issues with lights, car lights coming in for the adjacent property, and we are recommending um, a, a, bu a buffer in that area. In terms of wastewater and water servicing, the servicing feasibility study demonstrates that the site can be uh, well serviced and the, and the stormwater management pond will provide quality and quantity treatment for the development. The recommendation then, Your Worship, is considering the report for the proposed 19 unit townhouse development that Council approved the site plan by GM Blue Plan Engineering, subject to the conditions outlined in Appendix A, that you would pass a bylaw authorizing the Mayor and Clerk to execute the site plan agreement, and that you would um, also authorize a bylaw to allow the Mayor and Clerk to execute the documents necessary for a three meter road widening along the 9th Avenue uh, section. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm happy to move this uh, motion and recommendation contained and also congratulate the developer and his uh, working team on making such a, a great product for Owen Sound that's well needed. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's, it's a wonderful plan. It's one of the most needed, necessary types of housing to our community that, that we possibly could could have here our own sound right now is full of individuals living in two two and a half story brick homes you know from 15th street west north looking for this type of housing to move into it's they're uh, they're not looking for long-term care yet they're looking for this accessible housing style i do have some some sincere issues with some of the site conditions that we put on this um, this there's some I can understand if we have to move the gate to six meters, if that's because it's fire route, that's what the legal, uh, the provincial law mandates. You know, I can understand that. But I look at something like the sidewalk, and I thought, well, just a second. During the election, I was up in Lila Crescent, Lampson Crescent, and they don't have sidewalks. And the only thing I was hearing from those residents is, why are we paying the same rate of tax? as the rest of the city and we are in a condo complex and we pay for our own snow removal that doesn't seem right but beyond that ninth avenue a east where where your um, family member lives house really doesn't have sidewalks and it functions just fine 
and even across the street, the Adasha Home Subdivision. When I campaign there, there's no sidewalks. So why are we so heavy handed on this condition here? We've got a developer who, like the one at the Bayshore right now, the backhoe is ready to go on the ground. The best type of development we could have. We've got lots of promises and hopes for other stuff in the East Hill, but until you put the backhoe on the ground and put, you're not putting your money where your mouth is. This is one right here that they're ready to go, but we're conditioning the heck out of them. Even there's, a, there's comments in here, and I'd like some clarification on the biking stalls inside the garage, because my, it jumps out to me, okay, one owner has a Ford Focus. He pulls into his garage. He can put his bike in beside it. The next guy has a Chev pickup. He pulls into his garage. Now he can't put his bike beside it. So we've got a condition here that I think is unnecessary because it's completely undefinable. You know, we're not in the business of telling people what they can drive. People figure these things out on their own. And in this small little neighborhood, we're actually contravening one of the environmental pillars of our strategic plan when we're telling them to pave over more and pour more concrete. The best thing we can do in our community is have more permeable soils. It's the best solution we have for stormwater management is to allow the rainwater to naturally permeate into the soil, not pave everything over and force it into a stormwater management pond and further down into, into the, the manholes. But, you know, I guess I, I don't support it as is with all those conditions. And I would love to hear some more discussion about some of these conditions I think are, are monstrous uh, that we're applying. Thank you, Worship. Through you, in terms of the bike parking, this is a development that will remain as one property. So to comply with our zoning bylaw, it does require that there be three bike parking spaces provided on the site. Should the developer choose to provide sort of three bike parking spaces in the area of the um, clubhouse, that would suffice. What we've said is, in, rather than getting sort of into the nitty gritty, let's have their architect, their designer for the units confirm that the garages would be sized sufficiently to accommodate a car, standard size under the building code, and then also have a bike. Now whether that bike is um, creatively hung on a hook or a pulley system, just to leave it to the developer in terms of how they would ensure compliance. So the, the condition is geared to ensure that there's compliance with the zoning bylaw, Your Worship. In terms of the sidewalk, uh, I, I can't agree more with, uh, with Mr. Gregg, or Councillor Gregg. Um, at the invitation of uh, the developer, I, I went up there by myself this past weekend and walked the lot. Um, it's, it's a very nice lot, and needs to be commended for doing it. It's a very compact lot. It will have 19, not, uh, it will have 19 homes, I think six buildings. Uh, the entire area there will be barrier free as noted and, and as Mr. Graham was complimented for doing by Madam Director. I've been to these types of places in Florida and I'm sure many of us have uh, in elsewhere, I think Meaford's building one, again without sidewalks. The entire place is a single lot uh, guarded by a gate. It's not a high security gate but it's a gate, it gives comfort to the community. And what it allows is a certain conviviality and neighborhood, hood, uh, neighborhood feeling. Sidewalks can sometimes create setback issues. You have to push things back, push things around. This will come at a serious cost to development. I think it's unfortunate that we're doing for this particular unit. There will be plenty of accessibility between the units, and uh, I'm, I'm totally against the idea of putting sidewalks there. That's my first point, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Mayor. I'd also like to comment, though, as I read the brief over the weekend, I, I was frankly astounded at the length of time it took such a simple development to get to the point of approval by the city. And uh, I'm not pointing fingers, but I think we really need to look at streamlining our processes, and I'd like to speak to the, uh, perhaps that in a different forum. This land is located between the French School and Notre Dame. It is on sanitary, it is on storm sewer, it is a flat piece of land, it is completely unremarkable. It has been vetted by the city before when it was a 29 uh, 
unit uh, development and so forth. And it remains a single private lot after it's developed. If we're taking the better part of a year to give the green light to the developer, I think it's a, it's a sad comment on planning within the city, and I think it's something that it, it behooves us, since we're talking 19th century language, it behooves us to take a look at, uh, at why we're making developers wait this length of time. But in terms of the sidewalk, I'd urge all the councillors to, uh, to reconsider whether a sidewalk would be necessary for this particular unit. Others? Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Well, Councillor Greg, you went to the wrong guy when you asked me about 9th Avenue AEs because that might be the most dysfunctional street in the city of Owen Sound, and I would look at that as a mistake. It's got no sidewalks. So I saw where there is a, a difference of opinion with the sidewalks, and you know, so I went to Mr. Graham's uh, most recent project, or I think his most recent one, up at the Medical Arts on Alpha Street, I see sidewalks. I went down to the Trevor Heather's new uh, apartment unit behind Kelso Beach Camping Grounds, and I see nothing but sidewalks. I went up to the entrance into Zares, sorry, um, Barry Christopher's units, and there's all sidewalks. So I, w I would ask maybe um, Ms. Colder, if you, can you give us examples of what other developers do? Like, is this something different we're asking this developer to do, or give me some examples of what we do with these sidewalks? Um, through your worship, certainly Own Sound Municipal Nonprofit Housing has provided sidewalks within that development um, to, to uh, 6th and 9th Avenue. Um, Georgian Landing, which Council approved a few meetings ago, um, there are sidewalks both from 2nd and 3rd Avenues connecting the sidewalk on the street um, to the development. Um, certainly the commercial development like Zares and Heritage Grove, um, we've been able to achieve excellent sort of connectivity within those developments for pedestrians. Um, so certainly there, there are examples. I think here we can achieve um, sidewalks if it's Council's wish um, without adjusting the number of units. The, um, I think the application was made for the um, following the pre-consultation on September 24th. Unfortunately, um, this fall we were short-staffed in our planning division and um, we also were able to recruit and bring on a, another planner. So I apologize through, uh, through you, Your Worship, to the councillor if the timing in terms of this development wasn't ideal, but it's certainly not um, what's typical in our planning division staff on the development team um, work very hard to accommodate the wishes and timelines of the development community. Thank you. In addition to that, um, the, in, the entrance to this is already narrow, correct? Through your worship, the, um, the width of the street is proposed um, right now between probably seven and nine meters in terms of the site plan. Um, so that would be the that would include the area for the cars and the snow to be piled to the curbs. Right. So I can see people walking in and out of this place um, with, with no sidewalks. So you're, you're going in and out where the cars are in something that's already narrow. That does not sound accessible to me. And just one more further comment. Um, the Lamps and Crescent Lila Road area that was built, I don't know, 40 years ago, they won't have sidewalks. Um, there's no sidewalks along 6th Avenue uh, West by Hillcrest School, and that doesn't mean we build schools without sidewalks for our children because that's what we've done in the past. If that's what we're doing now, and this is the safest, and that's what we're making other developers do, I see no problem with these sidewalks. Those are my opinions. Councillor Thomas, you had your hand up. Since we're all talking about the sidewalks, I may as well wait in. I certainly support the motion as it's, uh, as it's presented. I think that that's a neighborhood in which we've already had requests uh, for non-sidewalked areas to be dealt with because of the sheer volume of school children in the area. And, uh, you know, we, this is a family area, and we're encouraging people to get out and be physically active. And uh, as a resident who lives downtown, anytime there's a good snowfall, Everybody is on the road, and it's just not a safe situation. So I certainly support uh, sidewalks in all new developments in the city. Okay, so have we had a motion. 
Marion did. Okay. Further discussion? No. Well, I'm going to call the question. All in favor? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Opposed? Two. So that is carried. Twelve E, regard to uh, purchase. Thank you, Worship. Uh, this is a replacement of a piece of equipment that's approximately 25 years old that was originally approved to be replaced in 2016. The vehicle has reached the end of its sufficient use, uh, useful life, meaning given how often we use it and its right reliability, it needs to be replaced. The low bid is higher than the approved budget but we expect to make up the difference with the price we will receive from auctioning off this piece of equipment. The reason it took this long to tender the project is because of the complexities of developing the specs, which requires creating three separate specs, one for the truck, one for the chassis, and then one for the crane itself, and then combining them into one. And by doing this while we're competing with other priorities. At this time, I'd just like to uh, uh, give my apology to council for taking this long to bring this forward and make sure that we, I'll make sure that we do this in a more timely manner once we have approval for such uh, purchases in the future once approved by council. Thank you. So we've got a report in front of you. Somebody want to put their hand up and move it? Anybody? Anybody? Councillor Gregg? I'll move the recommendation that we award the above noted to Lewis Motor Sales Incorporated lowest compliant bid received. Thanks. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Uh, 12F, Public Works Superintendent, Boundary Agreement. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'm wearing a different hat. I'm now the Superintendent of Public Works. Um, this agreement, uh, this staff report deals with the agreement that has essentially been in place for 20 years, first with the Township of Sarawak, then with the Township of Georgian Bluffs after amalgamation. The attached agreement spells out the details of the responsibilities of each of the municipalities and what type of maintenance is expected. The, agree the agreement ensures effective, efficient use of both municipalities' resources, and it takes and it doesn't make sense for two different jurisdictions to plow the same stretch of road. In terms of finances, it's a wash after both, uh, given that both municipalities are essentially using approximately the same value of resources. Thank you, Councillor Kepke. Thank you, Your Worship. Being the good neighbors we are, I'd like to move this recommendation. All in favor? It's carried. 12G, report from the fire chief with regard to uh, closure of 10th Street Bridge. Planning ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, members of council. Um, as everybody knows, we are anticipating the 10th Street Bridge to be closed in the fall of 2019. Um, Intertownship Fire Department Management and Owen Sound Fire Emergency Service Management have met and we have talked about what we believe the bridge closure will have on our traffic and our ability to respond to emergencies on the opposite side of town from our, from our, our stations. We as a management group have discussed options and we have decided on one which we believe to best meet our and anticipated needs. I need to emphasize we are anticipating a level of disruption to traffic which may or may not be accurate. We uh, may have to adjust our recommended operation plan to suit when it is closed. In September of 2018, we took a recommended proposal to the ITFD board, and this uh, plan was also taken to Owen Sound Council on September 27th of 2018, and it was also agreed to. Local 531, our Owen Sound firefighters, were advised of this proposal on October 1st, and a meeting was then requested by Local 531 over concerns that they, they had with the plan. We were able to get together on November 14th. We met with Local 531 to discuss this plan, and the following concerns were presented to us by Local 531 Executive. The Intertownship Fire Department station is not equipped with the same truck exhaust system as our station, so there is a health and safety concern over the safety of local 531 members should they be parking any vehicle in the intertownship station. There was a concern relating to security of our staff while in the intertownship fire department station. Uh, this was not elaborated on. 
There may be a concern as to whether the kitchen and washroom facilities are adequate for staff. This will have, have to be looked at. Uh, Local 531 advised us that they believe training is a very important part of their daily routine and the positioning of two members in the ITFD station during the day shift will disrupt their training routines and may be a health and safety concern. Local 531 will not allow ITFD staff to assist us in initial responses to structure fires on the west side of town unless a second and third alarm is activated. We were advised agreements would be filed under the contracting out clause. Local 531 is not in favor of allowing an ITFD truck to be parked in the city station unless our truck exhaust system is modified. Again, this could lead to a health and safety concern. During this meeting, Local 531 was asked for recommendations as to how they believe we can address the response concerns during the time the bridge is under construction. We got into a discussion and they believe there are times when we head to the west side and the 10th Street Bridge is plugged and they go to the 9th Street Bridge and the 8th Street Bridge. As you are aware, nine lanes are going to be cut down to four lanes. I do not believe that um, there is going to be room on the 8th Street and 9th Street Bridge once the 10th Street Bridge is closed. Um, in the September report to Council, I anticipated a cost of approximately $12,000 for us to help the ITFD on calls in, in Sydenham Township, or Meaford, I should refer to. Should we attempt to meet the concerns that were just presented, the first step will be as to how we reach, reach these, these issues. Uh, if it is determined that we will alter our plan to uh, gain or to deal with these issues, a financial impact might be able to be figured out at that time. And I just want to emphasize, um, I believe the 10th Street Bridge is going to cause a huge disruption, not only to Owen Sound people, but everybody using Owen Sound. Um, I believe the only way to get around this is to work with the inner township. Um, we have a plan in place. This plan is not just to help Owen Sound public, it is to help the township public. We are going to go into the township for any structure fires on the east side as a first response. So we need to get people on scene as quickly as we can. So this plan that we have in place is not just for Owen Sound, it's for Owen Sound and area people. So my uh, recommendation tonight is to take direction from council on how we carry on here. I believe we need to carry on the way we're going and uh, deal with uh, any bumps that we get along the way. So. Thank you, Worship. Um, first question maybe for Mr. Ritchie. This isn't the first time we've had a disruption and had to move. Um, so with the old city hall, we had no heating or air conditioning. Everything was totally dysfunctional. We had mold in the building. We had asbestos in the building. We had how many grievances filed by the union in this building? I, I think as to through your worship health related issues to the building i'm not sure we had any grief and grievances we, we had did have one staff member that had a skin irritation during the later part of our stay here and we accommodated that staff member by fortunately we were able to move them to another site to work so i'm i'm not sure we had a grievance but we did have someone that had a complaint right so there was no grievance thank you um and then we moved our entire staff from city hall to another building most of our, player, our, our employees were working in rooms with no windows, no natural light for up to two years. Did, was there any grievances filed there? Not, not to my knowledge, Your Worship. Okay, so I'm just looking at Local 531's concerns here. Um, they have seven of them. Th uh, three out of the first six is all about their health and safety concern, correct? Correct. Or that's what was stated in the meeting, yes, correct. The one that's bothering the, me the most is, um, you know, all their, all their health and safety concerns. And then number seven, uh, Local 531, they believe that you may be exaggerating the impact to response and stated we should wait till the bridge is taken out and then determine if there's a concern. So we're going to try it. Like if we have a fire on the west side, we're just going to take, we'll just take a flyer. If somebody happens to die because we can't get there is that what they mean I I can't honestly you know comment for them but the I just want to make sure I'm reading that right 
they want to wait and see after the bridge is out they want to wait and see I took from the conversation we deal with 10th Street being plugged at the present time and at that time when we cannot get across 10th Street we go to 9th Street and 8th Street and that does happen um, I do not believe when 10th Street closed that 8th Street and 9th Street is going to be open and available for us I, I, I do not believe waiting to see what happens is due diligence on behalf of the own sound fire service okay and the final one um, number four local 531 advised us that they believe training is a very important part of their daily routine and the positioning of two members in the inner township fire department station during the day shift will disrupt their training routines so i keep notes chief barfoot so the local 531 came here with a grievance for shift trades and i have written down here uh local 531 told city council we are professional firefighters and we can adjust our training time so which is it so when it comes to shift trades that they want they can adjust their training schedule and now they can't adjust their which is it uh, the one comment I will say I do agree with that training is very important um, I will comment that 10th Street Bridge is going to be a unique circumstance that we need to deal with in, in the city of Owen Sound and life is going to be different no different than people moving out of City Hall there's going to be disruptions we're going to have to work around it so yes training might get affected we might have to make up with it on nights we might have to make up for it on Saturdays and Sundays uh, we, we, we need to work to the circumstance that we have to deal with yeah and I just think it's it's just uh, it would be a good working agreement with the inner township fire department that just because of, of a rather bizarre situation that certainly we could step up and and put a truck on either side without any disruptions those are my comments I was in the audience when the consultants report was presented and ideas around working together in collaboration and future directions uh, was discussed I had reviewed the report and I look at the comments here I respect the union stance I respect the role of the firefighters what I don't see is collaborative partnership strategic planning and a just-in-time let's work together because this is a unique situation for our community the real key for me was when they were asked for options for help in solutions they they could not provide any all of us have to endure the next two years or less and I think we all need to be creative and figure out how to use the strength we have as a community in working together I would ask that further discussion and problem-solving happen because to pay more money for an exhaust system to be able to park a vehicle is more money and if we can be creative and figure out options without a cost that's that's a bonus bottom line we need to be kept safe in this community and we look to the professionals to do that in partnership this this is a unique situation how can we be creative and I, I look to the professionals to help us in this just to uh, comment on that there was no nothing uh, recommended during this meeting that's not to say there isn't something going to become okay, so thank you that's a hopeful thing through you to the chief uh, if we were to proceed with our plans as you had uh, earlier outlined what do you suppose the probable outcome would be um, and again I can uh, surmise there is a process in place and they have every right in the world to proceed with the process um, they have a collective agreement they have um, clauses in the collective agreement and they have a right to their own interpretation and should that disagree with what we plan on a proposal then they have every right to proceed with that which will take us to arbitration and through you your worship to the city manager what would the impact of that kind of action be on the provincial grant monies available to us to help complete this project 
through your worship, certainly those grant funds of, of $3 million uh, will not cover the cost of the bridge. The city ratepayer ultimately will be paying the difference. Anything that adds to that difference is clearly not good for the city ratepayer. So if the project is delayed unduly, the city ratepayer will be on the hook for another $3 million because we'll be unable to complete, possibly, possibly in time to suit the provincial uh, guideline. I, I, hadn't, I hadn't understood that part of the question, but absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chief Barfoot, the, the issues with regard to exhaust, is that something that can be solved easily? I have been in touch with the Minister of Labour rep from this area, and I've also been in touch with our area rep from the Public Service Health and Safety Association. Um, I've had a short conversation with both of them, and yes, I believe that can be dealt with without spending any money. So, thank you. Sorry, I have one more question. How are we different than, than an ambulance? Like, could we not just put a truck over on the museum parking lot there during the day with two men in it? And why do we have to have uh, the inner township building? If, if they don't want to put the truck in the building and they don't want to be in the building, um, why can't we just be like what the ambulance does? Um, again, going back to if anybody was in town during the big dig, uh, I was still on the trucks at that time and we parked in Ken Stewart's Texaco service station and we sat there for the day and used the washrooms there. Um, that was during the summer. We are anticipating a year, this is gonna be through the winter. Our trucks have water in them, they will freeze. Um, and again, for, I believe, um, this is a lot better for our staff too, to be inside a house building than to be sitting in a vehicle all day long. But if it's not, can you rotate trucks? Like, can you, can you have a truck there for three hours and then send another truck and bring that one back sort of thing? Or? We could certainly do that. I do not believe that is the most efficient way to provide protection to the people on the west side of Owen Sound. Thank you. The resolution, the recommendation is looking for direction. So we will need. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, we have a, a highly trained fire chief that we have put our trust into. And I think this is a continuation where we put our trust into his direction and his knowledge and continue with, with the path that he's laid out for us at this time. Um, if we have further information comes back from the from our fire department, from the association, great. Nobody's going to turn that down in terms of looking at it. But at this time, I think, it, you know, he's our fire chief and, and we continue the status quo. So you are moving the recommendation uh, with directions to proceed as um, previously directed. Does that work? Yeah. Everyone understands that? All in favor? Is carried. Thank you. 12H, report from Deputy Clerk with regard to acting mayor appointment. Appointments. Clerk. Not Through your worship, the recommendation in the report is to bring forward a bylaw to appoint acting mayors for the 2018 to 2022 term of council. This is a bylaw done with each term of council and it provides an alphabetical rotation of councillors each appointed for a month at a time. Councillor Dodd. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I do enjoy this uh, this way, this rotation is because I get to go first. So I will I will move the recommendation. <laughs> All in favor? That is carried. Thanks, Brenda. Twelve uh, I. Requests for letter of non-objection to wedding at Mudtown. Through your Worship, there's a couple looking to get married at Mudtown Station in June. For this event to take place, a temporary extension to Mudtown's liquor license is required. The application for this extension needs to include a letter of non-objection from the clerk once approved by council. Building, bylaw, <coughs> engineering, fire, planning, police, and the Grey Bruce Health Unit were circulated on this application and have no objection. There was some concern by engineering about parking, but the couple will be notifying guests of the limited space and suggesting other parking options. Fire services indicated that guests will only be under the tent or on the patio. The couple has advised that the washrooms will be used inside the restaurant and the guests may also sit inside the restaurant throughout the evening with the occupancy restrictions being abided at all times. 
Since no objections to the request were received, staff is recommending that Council direct the Clerk to submit a letter of non-objection to the applicant to include in their application to the AGCO. Thank you. Go ahead, Councilor Martin. Through Your Worship, I'm wondering if you could speak to the noise bylaw and if there's been any consideration regarding that. Go ahead. Through you, Your Worship, the noise bylaw goes until 11 p.m. And they have the couple has submitted a request to extend that till 12 p.m. It will be coming 12 a.m. I guess will be coming forward to council um, later in January. No concerns were expressed by any of the departments when it was circulated about noise. I have not heard from any public at this point. But this application is to extend the physical boundary out in the patio by 10 feet, and then a different noise application would come later to extend the time from 11 to 12. That's not part of this. Okay. Other questions? Councilor Kapke? How many guests are expected at this? 150. 150? Okay, and um, normally any activity at Mudstown Station, if they had a band there or something, like they did at Harbour Nights, what time did that close? 11 p.m. is our noise bylaw. So they had, uh, that activity yeah. had to quit by 11? Yes. So if they have music there, it has to stop by 11? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, motions. Councillor Thomas? I'll move that recommendation. <coughs> All in favor? That is carried. So we're down to the consent agenda. <coughs> just, just so no. I could. Council Hamley, just before oh, you sorry, go. Sorry, Your Worship. I'd like to ask that uh, item 13H, uh, the DIA minutes, be pulled from the consent agenda to be dealt with separately. Okay. Okay. Uh, moved by myself uh, that City Council receives items 13A to 13K, save and accept item 13H being dealt with separately on the consent agenda dated December 17th, 2018. And further, that uh, the recommendations contained in items 13A to 13D be approved. Okay, so all in favor of that motion? That is carried. Just go back through. I think there's uh, minutes from the library board. Yep, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, very much a business as usual. Uh, Library board meeting, uh, we did talk a little bit about our strategic planning process, which is ongoing and which we'll, uh, we'll be getting a report back at the start of the new year on that. Uh, renovation update, well, it was a little bit bumpy and it was a little bit cold in the library, having the roof and the HVAC replaced in the coldest uh, fall that we've had in quite some time, but we did make it through. And uh, great thanks to staff uh, for all of that. Uh, and that really, well, there's a report in there about the 40th annual book sale, which in these minutes was coming up, but I'm happy to report that the book sale went off without a hitch, uh, raised more than $20,000 for the library for special programming, and uh, again, a great thank you to the volunteers of the library for that. Any questions for Councillor Thomas on the library? Seeing none, so that gets us through the consent agenda with, re with the exception of 13H. Councillor Thomas. Yeah, Your Worship, um, these minutes have come forward to us without being approved by the DIA board. And that is certainly not the way we typically do things when we have minutes come forward from boards and committees. And I'd like to see these sent back to the DIA Board of Management for approval before they come before City Council. Uh, you know, this whole process has been difficult from the very start in terms of uh, what's going on vis-a-vis -vis parking and changes to the DIA uh, with steps and missteps. And I just want to see that the uh, I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. And I want to, my motion is to send these minutes back to the DIA Board of Management uh, and save and accept the October 24th minutes, which I'll make a separate uh, motion to approve those. that works that motion works as far as clarity goes so just to be clear it's the November 21st minutes that are going back to the DIA yes for thank approval. you okay. further discussion Councillor Kepke um, 
as usually the reporter of the DIA minutes, it was going to be my intent to move postponement of both sets of minutes because neither set of minutes have gone to the DIA board. Okay, so, so with that, I'm happy to amend my motion to uh, incorporate the 24th uh, minutes as well then. Okay, I'm going to call the question. All in favor? So that uh, is passed to send the minutes back to the Owen Sound DIA Board of Management. We're down to 14 on the agenda. 14A is minutes of community services uh, committee meeting held November 21st, 2018. Oh, did I miss something? Sorry, thanks, Mayor Bay. I had a couple items I wanted to mention in the information package. Okay. Uh, the first is correspondence from the senior office assistant from the town of Kearney regarding the voters list for municipal elections. Uh, they are looking for support. Uh, let me just now scroll down to item C. Uh, we all saw this firsthand. Uh, well, nobody saw it more so than the clerk's <coughs> office as to the difficulties of a an accurate voters list. Uh, I know I had one fellow put five voter cards on the table in, in front of me and say, you know, it's up to me. I could vote five times. I know the birth dates for these kids that haven't lived here in 20 some years. Uh, so what they're looking for is support to their resolution uh, that there may be movement to, and I apologize here because I'm I'm all over the OBIA resolution here now. Page eight. Page eight? Yeah, sorry. Um, so they're looking for support that they, for a reestablishment of the multi-stakeholder working group between the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, Ministry of Finance, AMCTO, MPAC, and Elections Ontario and explore, in exploring and identifying ways to create and maintain the voters list for municipal elections. I think that's a great idea. Um, it, I won't say it was a travesty, but good Lord, the information that our clerk's department is provided is awful. And I'm not a genius on Excel, but when I downloaded that as our right is as a counselor or a candidate, I saw just in quick find and searches, multiple individuals coming up that, that I could take out. So to support their, their resolution here. Uh, and for us then to acknowledge back to their municipality our support. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Is there a second piece there? I did have a second piece. Uh, a week and a half just, ago. Just, be, just before you go, are we getting a report on the uh, election? We'll come back to council and when? Any idea? Ooh, so it's coming quickly. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, the second. Uh, important piece of information there is if the Ontario government's new environment plan for um, consultation and the steps that they are taking to address climate change. They have made a very firm directive that municipalities will improve stormwater management and uh, there will be a solid look at the expansion of green bin collection systems in large cities in relevant businesses, develop a proposal to ban food waste from landfill, reduce plastic waste through development of a national strategy. Uh, another couple are revised brownfield regulation and record of site conditions to reduce barriers to redevelop contaminated land, make it easier to re reuse excess soils. Nothing that we're, or I'm asking us for any action, but boy, there is a lot of information there that we should be putting in our back pocket moving forward to consider it, particularly their focus and directive on municipalities improving stormwater management and uh, essentially not allowing uh, sewage bypassing. Uh, and which we have made great steps as a municipality, but it still occurs and you're going to get uh, much more information in January from our last operations meeting, uh, even on the west side pumping station. So good information there just to, for everyone just to note and recognize. Good. Thanks, Thank Mayor you. 14A, Minutes of Community Services Committee. Thank you, Your Worship. So I will be making uh, the report on these minutes. So it was uh, the last meeting, actually, of our, our past council. So this was done by uh, Chair McManaman. So first of all, we had a deputation uh, from the Indigenous 150 plus mobilizing reconciliation in Owen Sound and Great Bruce. 
Um, the Indigenous 150 Plus group is a film and uh, conversation series that illuminates the history, culture, and perspectives of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people across Canada. Um, their, aim, their aim was to help uh, push history, heritage, and culture by educating Canadian citizens of, and visitors to Olin Sound and Groupers counties, and they were looking to build on their achievements and audience feedback to create a quarterly series that continues to foster relationships, educate, and build community relationships on a year-round basis. Our first report that we, uh, we dealt with was uh, the Harrison Park Inn, which was a lease agreement extension. This is a, a, a one that has been uh, coming up. The term is, is uh, for 10 years, ending on January 31st, 2021. This had been negotiated uh, for a 10-year lease back in 2011. Um, and at that time, um, it was set that uh, the base rent would be $24,000 per year. And uh, in with that, it was included that uh, the, the uh, the tenant would also look into constructing a patio, outdoor patio, as well as replacing the aging HVAC system um, to help with the reduction of that rent. So just as a, another side profile here, in the 2018 capital budget, um, we were looking to do exterior washroom renovations for $10,500 to the um, washrooms at uh, the Harrison Park Inn. This was to upgrade the washrooms, do some uh, fixture upgrades, and install efficient lighting and be compliant with the Ontario Building Code, including accessibility. So during this uh, request, this is why it was such an important request to come up, the, the tenant had also advised that she'd be willing to uh, upfront $20,000 to uh, incorporate the new style of renovation to that building, work with the municipality in a partnership, which would basically be a 50-50 uh, split deal on grading renovation uh, for those units. That way it's both efficient, both for the outside areas as well as the inside areas for um, the inn as well. Um, when we took a look at that, some of the normal uh, restaurant rates that are typically anywhere within Owen Sound, there was between $8 and $15 per square foot with an average of $10 to $12 per square foot. Currently, if you looked at what uh, the tenant was currently paying at the end of the 2017 year, plus inflation over those course of those years, we were basically paying $15.62 per square foot, which is uh, quite reasonable for a uh, a rate to be receiving. Included in that uh, is also that they did $33,000 in renovations over that time, which included the $28,000 for a new patio and $5,000 for a new HVAC system. Plus, not to mention they pay $4,000 in garbage plus taxes. So um, at the end of the 2017 year, they're paying $27,000, $868 a year. Um, not to mention, as we said, $14,000 around there in taxes. Um, what we had to, had a discussion about was whether or not to go have discussion whether this was going to go to an RFP process or whether this was going to go into a discussion with the, the tenant uh, about um, seeing if we can approve in principle um, to put together another lease agreement up until 2028 and uh, that is what the committee approved. Um, the second report that we received was for uh, the Tom Thompson Art Gallery regarding a, a goalie mask public art proposal. This is, if you don't, aren't aware of what is going on currently at the Tom Thompson Art Gallery, you should uh, definitely go check it out. It's, uh, it's called um, Saving Face, Art in Front of the Hockey Net Exhibit it's at the, the Tom Thompson Art Gallery until March 30th, 2019. And currently they're going to have, uh, basically they're celebrating the art of the goalie mask. So there's a an large goalie mask that is there that uh, was sponsored by MacArthur Tire. So after the exhibit, um, obviously if this is a piece that's been uh, provided to the, to the art gallery and towards the city, so we'll be looking to putting it, relocate it, and one of the options that came up was putting it into the Bay Shore. So the mask will be located in the front lobby, uh, be on a en stand engineered specifically for the mask, and, and uh, it's more or less for a social media frenzy where children can come up, take a picture with the mask, and, and kind of get around with it and be a little more interactive with it. So following the initial display at the Bay Shore, it is ant anticipated that the mask will remain on the ground display for the duration of the project, and then the, ma and the mask will be on ground display each fall from September through November, and then suspended in a location chosen at the Bay Shore. Um, following that, we got a report uh, regarding our summer events wrap up. Um, Canada Day, which was a great success. We had 3,000 visitors there uh, at Kelso Beach throughout the day. One thing that will be changing in the 2019 year, staff is recommending that the event begin at 4 o'clock instead of 12 o'clock. And this is more to encourage families to come and enjoy some of the entertainment and activities and then be able to stay for the fireworks. We're, 
currently if you're there at, at noon and you have some children, by the time you're around for four or five hours, I think they're getting pretty, uh, pretty tired and ready to go home and sometimes they will miss the opportunity to see the fireworks. So this is one way that we are also be able to contain with our volunteers as with every other service uh, in, in the community. Volunteers is a big part, a big and an important part that sometimes is missing. Um, so if we have condensed hours, it also helps with our volunteers. Um, we also can give an update on the TD Harbor Nights, which took place over eight Sunday evenings. The total event attendance for this was 2,557 people, well, on average about 320 people per concert, which is actually really crazy to think there's 320 people at, uh, at uh, the Rail Museum there to watch that. The net budget was uh, a cost of $1,500, um, and I think that was a, a great event. Um, a new one that came out was an outdoor movie night. This is a, some, a new approach to the traditional music and movies event. Um, so they basically go up and they put up a blow-up screen and they play a new movie and they kind of draw some children in and their families to watch this new, uh, new, screen, or new movie. Uh, so that happened on three Thursday nights. Total event tents for that was 620 people. On average, 207 people again. I would say that's really good. Uh, there was a significant increase over the 2017 a year, and the actual net budget was a cost of uh, $9,000, which was about $6,500 under budget. Harbor Fest, also, we all obviously know how much of a great event that was. That was held in July, and approximately 6,000 people attended that. Um, we did get another report uh, from our manager of community development and marketing regarding the proposed RAC card. Um, this was a new idea that, uh, that um, the manager of our community development and marketing had presented to committee. This would be a record that was going to have uh, some different information listed on it that would be sent to quarterly. Um, however, through discussion with committee, um, this would be, sorry, this would be to replace the annual calendar that has been received by uh, residents in the past. And going through committee, a uh, committee had recognized the fact that uh, they felt the calendar was still more uh, more desired than some of the rack cards where the rack cards could be, you know, you're viewed for a couple of minutes and then potentially um, hit the, the waste bin, whereas a calendar could be up and displayed and, and still have some of the importance of showing what the events were going on in the community. Um, and so committee chose to go ahead with the, um, the production dist distribution of the 2019 events calendar. So it will be a physical calendar. And I have heard notice that the calendar is uh, being printed currently and will be ready for the new year. Um, I've got a following report again about uh, an update, a uh, wrap up for power skating, hockey skills, soccer camp, and Harris Park swimming. Um, these are all activities that we take that go on within the city during the summer months for our youth. So it's run from June till August. Of, um, so some of the financial information for the three camps. Power skating resulted in net profit $854. The hockey skill camp uh, it was a net loss of 165. Um, overall, a net revenue for about 688 dollars for both those camps, which is a complete improvement of about 1500 dollars. The soccer camp resulted in a net profit of 477 dollars. Um, Harrison Park Pool, as everyone is aware, the pool is now a more family-friendly event, enjoyable, accessible. Um, it's really drawing a lot more people, and from our stats that we had, even though we started a little bit later in the year, that our participation numbers were up in the 2018 year from 2017. Um, we had a report from the Director of Community Services regarding the Potter's Field Monument interpretive plaque. If you're unaware of what uh, the Potter's Field Monument means, it's a, a, an area up at the Greenwood Cemetery that contains about 1,200 um, individuals that came from, uh, basically were suffering from extreme poverty and they're all based put into a, a, a mass grave. Um, so one of the things that, and uh, this is a odd, it's on uh, going currently on social media um, regarding a survey to kind of obtain public input and feedback regarding how this monument's going to look. And I'll just give you a, a background on that. The anonymous donor stepped up and said uh, they were willing to fund uh, the monument for this. Uh, this is actually a really historical piece, um, so which is we're thankful for that donor to put this in because it's obviously something that's very important to our, our history. Um, so in tw spring of 2019, there will be an open house to discuss the different feedback that has received over this uh, winter months. Um, and over the summer of 2019, the design of the monument will be presented to, uh, back to community services. Um, and we can start dealing with the manufacturing of the monument installation and public unveiling. Um, next report we got was from the Manager of Parks and Open Space. Normally this committee is a lot more fun. So just so 
And there was a lot on the agenda here. It was Councillor McManaman's last meeting, so I think he has a habit of running this down pretty good. Um, so we, and we've got an update on the Greenwood Cemetery Master Plan Review and update as well. Um, the Manager of Parks and Open Space advised that the 2018 and 2019 Master Plan uh, process will be conducted in-house using existing staff and resources. And some of the key deliverables are having in January and February of this, of this upcoming year, some background research conducted on the industry's trends with a focus on how cremations, natural burials, and cultural sensitivities will influence our service delivery for the next five years and project our capacity to the next 50 and 100 year horizons. Um, it goes on and basically back into, um, it'll be reviewed by uh, the public at a public meeting back in March of 2019 and then forwarded to council. Uh, our last report that we did receive was uh, regarding the forest schools that take part uh, at uh, the community hall at Harrison Park. This is a, a school that's now evolved into two schools. One is a, a private uh, enterprise and one is done through with the East Ridge Community School. Um, and at this time they'll be doing different sort of outdoor activities, maybe making a, a monument or, an acti or a, some sort of sculpture outside. With, and uh, Anyways, so what they use, they actually use the community center as a, a home base for their activities, use the washroom, maybe have some snacks in there during, a, uh, during the day as well. So overall, the, the community center for the Harrison Park the overall booking revenues have increased drastically because of the community center being used as this for, as a direct result. Um, and at the time of writing this port year-to-date revenues from the forest schools totals about six thousand dollars and overall year-to-date revenues for that center are sixteen thousand so you can see that there's a, quite a substantial amount of income that's coming in from usage of that is related to the forest schools um, so we're actually projecting to a year end that the city expects to generate a surplus of ten thousand dollars so we were, made the motion that we were recommending to council to receive that report approved by law to allow uh, the continuation agreement with the East Ridge and uh, the Owen Sound Forest School and then maintaining the current existing fee structure for rentals. So with that, Your Worship, I would move approval of these minutes and take any questions from any uh, councillors at this time. Councillors, any questions? Councillor Greg? Well, I only just have uh, one comment and it's regarding the building stats. I just wonder if our clerk has some information that I sent just to, to put. Do you have that available? Um, I've just been watching the last few months, uh, and we do just month over month. And uh, I took a couple minutes over the weekend just to jot down, I think something that would be better for council moving forward would be if, I know three years ago when we had planning committee, we had a year to date. So we had better metrics than what we've got or than what we've been using um, just this year and last year where it was just here's what we did in October, and here's what we did in October 17. That's not that valuable. So I just scrolled down a couple things that I point out, and I, you know, I used some different colors just to kind of strip out some of the institutional building, because I think one of those big building values is likely uh, the county building. I'm, I'm just, gonna, just gonna say hold on here for a second. You're presenting a report now to council that no one's seen before. And it wasn't this. This is a presentation of minutes from a meeting. Sure. What you're presenting wasn't part of the minutes that was presented to that committee. I'm, I'm questioning just the appropriateness. I get get the point. It's something that would have been great to be raising at the committee. I'm not sure this is the time and the place when they weren't part of the minutes that we're presenting to. Uh, Council for approval. Yeah, fairly taken. I just, it had been something that I'd wanted to work on for a while in, in terms of how we can better track the I, I data through the year. I wonder if you but want to sit down with one of the directors at some point and uh, maybe have that discussion with them of what you'd like to see in a report coming to the committee. That, that might be more, it might achieve more. I don't mean to cut you off, but it just, I don't know how technically we go through this when it isn't part of the minutes that we're trying to approve. Other questions? Councillor uh, Tammy, go ahead. Yeah, this was part of the minutes. Uh, I, I know Ms. White is in the room, and I just want to acknowledge in terms of the Harrison Park Inn, uh, I think it's a charming restaurant. She has a proven track record. She was required under a current lease to do some very expensive things. She did them. She did them on time. and. Uh, it's a beautiful little place and it's a real asset to the community. So I'm very pleased what the committee decided to do in terms of that. And uh, I hope we, we get their full support tonight. 
the comments. Councillor Kepke, you had your hand up. Just a comment on what Councillor Gregg was presenting. It would have been appreciated, I think, by all of Council to have received this ahead of time, too. Good. I'm going to call the question, which is to uh, approve the Community Service Committee uh, minutes from November 21st, 2018. All in favor? That is carried. Uh, 14B, minutes of Corporate Services Committee. It's back to you, Councillor Gregg. So we've got two months to go through here. The October meeting started with a deputation from Jennifer Miller. She's our newly, well, some newly elected school board trustee. And she's also in the local big brother, big sister um, organization. Uh, she presented a deputation on the employer mentorship sponsorship program for a committee. This program has partnered employers having employees coordinated during school time to go in and associate with their little, known as uh, the little brother, little sister, as a big, referred to as big brother, big sister. Uh, the committee informed Jennifer that the city does not, allow, does not offer grants and declined the request for $25,000 in sponsorship, which was asked during the deputation. The city, we don't have uh, a dedicated grants allotment uh, to have you know just to subjectively go through and, and offer uh, staff will in the future though uh, return a report to committee on what taking part in the employer mentor sponsorship program could look like so we'll get that in the future committee received the monthly time management stats for the fire department committee re also recommends to council to proceed with a bylaw which would appoint an alternative member of county council. For those uh, not too familiar with that subject, it came up uh, during the last term of county council. There was an individual with one of the municipalities uh, not able to fulfill their role, and uh, they had a couple decisions that were somewhat um, a little controversial, I guess. So uh, this came on during the last term of council, and we are just uh, committee is wishing or recommends to council to proceed with the bylaw to continue that. Each quarter, the committee receives information from bylaw, the, the bylaw department on responding and enforcing uh, the bylaws. You may note uh, in the information that was provided that there was just over six hours of overtime incurred during Q3. Um, so that report was received for information. And then uh, probably our last report was uh, report 18108, which is a recommendation of committee to council to approve an increase in the remuneration of 10%, which represents the amount of tax and OMERS that would otherwise be refunded on one third of remuneration to keep income revenue neutral, despite the change implemented at the federal level. So some background on this that's in the report and the information is that since 2001 municipalities had to continue to approve a bylaw ratifying the one-third tax-free resolution. In the spring of 2017, the Justin Trudeau government was looking for more money and removed the allowance for municipal officials, which was in place to recognize the small and continual incurrence of costs ancillary to the municipal role, the roles that you all do going about the community uh, to various events and so forth. This report was requested to come forward to council from that change in spring of 2017. The original report in September did not contain the OMERS implications, so committee was provided various options to move forward. Because the report cannot be constructed, recognizing the actual amounts of income each individual councillor uh, earns during a year, uh, and the resultant impact from the tax rates that would be applied to those levels of income, the report uses an assumption of a tax rate of 20%. Applying the one-third amount of council income to the tax rate generates an increase of 6.7% in the level of remuneration. The second option, and this is the one that was recommended by committee with one opposed, was uh, an increase of 10%, which considers both the taxation and the impact of the OMERS contribution into account. The resultant impact to the 2019 budget would be approximately $28,000. And that uh, was the October minutes, and I ask for your approval of the re recommendations therein. I uh, welcome any questions. Go ahead. 
I have a concern about the 10% increase for council. We've just come through an election year where all who put their hat in the ring understood what the payment would be for the role. We've just tonight approved a significantly less increase for the staff. I am concerned at the optics of, in this day and age, of approving a 10% increase for council. This is on a go forward basis. I understand the history. I, I do not support that particular recommendation and not that there shouldn't be some consideration. I feel that 10% uh, perhaps does not reflect the percentage increase that's awarded to other people in the community when they need wage increases. I wonder if, go ahead. It's just to clarify a little bit, the comparison that's being uh, used here to, to the report earlier tonight is increasing actual take-home pay, but the feeling and the opinion of committee is that they didn't feel that municipal officials should receive a lesser take-home pay resultant from the tax changes in 2017 going forward. So they were really just wanting uh, and recommended that the actual take-home level of pay be the same. It's, yeah, it, it is an increase, but your councillors aren't taking home any more resulting from it. They're just paying tax on it like everyone else. Councillor Tamek. Uh, can I ask uh, through the chair, why wasn't this matter raised during the election by anybody? I understand that the tax change itself was public knowledge prior to the election. I, I, ju I just like to know why it wasn't raised. Again, we had it on our September uh, committee report, and it was just a brief three, um, it was about two and a half pages. There wasn't a lot of information there. There was still information that we received uh, after the fact that's included in the package there, which was a, a brief from the Federation of Municipalities of, no, FCM, Federation of Canadian Municipalities. So we had further information come in after that motion of postponement to the October meeting, where we went from a very simple one-line recommendation to further or, and more extensive information that was resulting from that. Go ahead. I just think, I appreciate it's a gross up. It's meant to offset a tax hit that we're taking, and I get that, but all of that information was known prior to the election. And I heard no councillor raise it. I did not hear it part of the public debate. Uh, I will not be in favor of this. I appreciate in the grand scheme of things it's not a ton of money, but to me it violates the rule, uh, I think it's an ancient rule, that councillors should not touch their own compensation for whatever reason. Um, if all these valid reasons existed, it should have been discussed during the election in my respectful opinion. And I don't think the electors of this community will appreciate the raise uh, being done in this fashion. I, I just don't, so I'm opposed, Mr. Chairman. I just respond that during election you had every opportunity to raise it. It had been uh, dealt with at the county. It had been uh, lots of press across the nation. Uh, it was definitely a, an issue that was in the public. Uh, it wasn't raised, but you could have raised it as much as anybody else. It was, it was out there. Um, there is no, you're suggesting that it was hidden or something, is, is sort of the accusation, which I don't think is accurate. Mr. Chairman, I'm not suggesting it was hidden. Apparently it was, I'm saying it was not fleshed out. I don't know why the onus would be on me as a candidate to talk about this. Well, it, seems, it, seems, it seems to me councillors who have knowledge of their own compensation, who saw this gross up coming down the highway, could have said in the election campaign, by the way, we're going to support a 10% gross up. I don't, I'm not accusing anything nefarious. I'm just saying that I think it's inappropriate to touch your own compensation as elector, as, as councillor. I appreciate there's different opinions on it. But there, okay, we do approve our own compensation. We're stuck with that. No one else is going to do it for us. I know other municipalities that have done it, and the next term is uh, it's going to be affected the next term. So, yeah. It's still our final approval. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. 
Thank you, Worship. Maybe through you to uh, the city manager, can you give a little background about how the, re uh, the separate remuneration committee was uh, started to, first of all, set the rates that they are for uh, councillor wages, first of all, and what the back incentives were from those five public members who were not members of committee or council who uh, came up with those, uh, those ideas of why they should be, uh, council should be paid they, what they are, um, and then that maybe help understand the reasoning behind um, trying to, when a motion like this is pushed forward, it has a little bit more backing of why that was there. Uh, certainly, I'll, I'll try through your worship, and if I get waylaid, uh, Miss Allen will certainly help me. She's more familiar with the current situation. I'm perhaps from the past situation. But we have had uh, three or four council remuneration committees formed, usually in the second year of council, so that they can determine at arm's length what councillors should be paid. Uh, I've sat in probably on at least three of those. Um, I will say the committee members take it quite serious. They're public members. They're supported by staff. We survey like municipalities and come up with, um, in their opinion, what a councillor, mayor and deputy mayor in the city of Owen Sound should be paid. They look at benefits. They look at other issues. And I believe on the issue of the one-third tax allowance that, quite frankly, yes, we did all see coming for quite a while. I believe they decided that they would not weigh in on that option. Is that fair, Ms. Allen? So they, they said, we're going to determine what you should get as a gross pay, and that was recommended to council, and my recollection, council has always accepted their recommendations. They did not want to weigh in on this one-third allowance. I don't know if that helps, councillor, or, or doesn't help. It doesn't, yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. just wonder if maybe I can move acceptance of the minute, save and accept, then report 18108, and we can vote on it separately. Just through, what's the uh, the total cost at the end of the day? Approximately twenty eight thousand. Okay. Just before we go, I will point out that this was a decision made by uh, Corporate Services Committee, which is made up of public members, and in fact, the motion was moved by a non councillor and uh, discussed in detail by all the public members at the time. So. You're moving the uh, minutes saved and except for that uh, one particular part, which I think you can't really see on the screen. I think it's, uh, how do I identify that? Uh, so 10A, ten, ten so um, save and accept 10A uh, in that report, all in favor. That is carried. Now if you want to do something with 10A. Sorry, Mayor Bite. Thank you. I would move approval of the recommendation on 10A from committee. Okay. Further discussion? Go ahead. I would like the vote recorded, please. Okay. Further discussion? Call the question. All in favor? I'm going to clerk. Hold on. Going to clerk to us. Uh, sorry. Councillor Dodd? In favor? Councillor Gregg? In favor? Councillor Hamley? Against. Councillor Kepke? In favor. Councillor Merton? Against. Councillor Tamming? Opposed. Councillor Thomas? In favor. Deputy Mayor O'Leary? In favor. Mayor Body? In favor. The resolution is carried with six in favor and three opposed. Thank you. So we're on to uh, 14C, Minutes of Operations Committee, held November 13th, 2018. Oh, sorry. Through your worship, there's another set of corporate services minutes there. Oh, that was only the November 22nd one. Okay. I know you're tired of hearing from me tonight, but I didn't say much during the marijuana. Uh, so we met again in November, okay. and committee received the monthly time management statistics from the uh, fire department. And of particular note uh, with the department uh, in the last month is the outfitting and putting into service a new pumper. I believe it's called number two. Uh, the numbering system down at the fire hall is quite complex, so I, I, I've not yet figured out why it's two and, and the rotation, but uh, it's uh, a nice truck. Uh, had a tour of it about a week ago, Thursday or Friday, um, and uh, I know the guys are proud to, to have it out in the 
frontline service. It replaced the little ladder truck that was called uh, Squirt, and it sits now as the uh, backup truck. Uh, so we've got two frontline pumpers and the large aerial. Uh, also to note, the firefighters have been working uh, lots the last several weeks with the annual toy drive for children in our community is a very high member of individuals that they are striving to fulfill Merry Christmases for uh, and be sure to uh, for the um, and be sure to support their efforts and thank them the next few days in the community when you see them out and about uh, delivering uh, toys and and various items for those in need in our community uh, we've also within the uh, time management stats you'll note that um, through the fire chief or with the fire chief's uh, work and with the staff down there, their overtime accruement this year is significantly down from 2017. And uh, that should be uh, recognized. Uh, it's very much appreciated by the taxpayer to have that kind of cost savings uh, coming about. It was mentioned even during the campaign, hire more firefighters. But I think this data right here proves and demonstrates that you no, know, there was savings to be had and, and we're realizing it. So our thanks on behalf of the, the rate payer on uh, a significant reduction in the overtime allotment there. Committee also recommended advancing the vacancy rebate program to the next step, which is to solicit feedback from stakeholders. A uh, bit of background on this is that last July we received a deputation on the program. Uh, the committee and council voted to move forward on the vacancy rebate program, uh, considering alternatives to altering it or uh, uh, eliminating it. The, in September, council approved staff to continue with this step, aligning with the process necessary to make a future submission to the province on how we would like to continue or discontinue the current program. The survey is merely part of that continuation the steps that we need to take. So that's information we've been able to piggyback off the consultant who's done this work for many other municipalities. Committee received an informative report on assessment at risk. We have accrued approximately $700,000 for non-residential assessment review board decisions. So this is largely commercial industrial decisions where the um, individual, not the individuals, but the applicants are going to the assessment review board. It's handled differently than any individual with their person with their home residence. Uh, the 20, I guess, uh, the numbers utilized in the consultant's report are that we have a non uh, or a current at risk assessment of approximately $1.5 million. We've got $700,000 uh, in reserve or, or available to account for that at risk. The 2019 budget includes $250,000 more for this unfunded potential liability. So we still have that considerable gap between what may come about down the road. It's not will, but it's may. Um, and we've been seeing these assessment review decisions, you know, being negative to municipalities for quite some time. So uh, we're trying to be proactive and uh, budget uh, properly uh, planning for that. We had uh, a Q th our Q3 financial report, which shows that the operating budget is trending currently to approximately $350,000 under budget. This is key drivers are wages and uh, gapping. And this is being offset by positive variances and higher expenses, uh, higher expenses for financing, winter control materials, landfill, and a reduction in recycling revenue. So we've been seeing this for the last half a year. Our current, our capital, Expenditures are currently projecting a very small surplus of approximately $60,000. Keep your fingers crossed. I mean, we want a white Christmas, but maybe just the right amount of white. Uh, and uh, there are some key recommendations to this report resulting from the information in the Q3 report. So I'm just going to read the actual recommendations from committee which are that council directs staff to transfer the surplus on the campground activity to the campground reserve to help offset the cost of the electrical and water upgrades in the campground. Two, and that council directs staff to transfer the surplus generated on the operating of City Hall through construction phase to the City Hall capital project to reduce future debenture payments. 
3 and that council direct staff to reduce the transfer from reserves to offset the cost of the building services division by the amount of surplus generated by building permit revenues and the the recommendation that was passed by committee and we will go a little further in depth with this yet because it's uh, much more uh, much more information than the first three for that 145 000, and that council direct staff to transfer to the DC reserve $145,000 representing a phased in approach on properties that have achieved occupancy and supplemental taxes have been earned and that council direct staff to accrue any further surplus at year end to the accrued tax write-off account in anticipation of ARB appeal decisions now this the DC conversation now comes about or results from the holiday. In 2015, we passed a motion that during the period of the residential development charge holiday, municipal tax revenue from construction be diverted to a capital reserve until such time as lost development charge revenue for hard services is recovered. Uh, the committee had, uh, there's a lot of discussion and uh, then we were treading water actually on the best approach on four, whether it was A, B, C. Uh, we can, I can defer to Kate if people have questions on, on this subject matter because it's, there's a lot of information. She's got terrific charts, uh, charts for reference that she's built on how we have, uh, we've accrued the, the taxes that have been earned as people have been moving into the, the new construction, the new builds, but we have this obligation from that original, uh, and I think it is we're bound by law, this is what has to be done, we choose the method of doing it, but we have to account for that in a capital reserve. Uh, so I take any questions to this point, uh, questions on the DC for more information, if you'd like to ask Kate. Uh, if you'd like to simplify uh, the minutes and we do one, two, and three, and then separately four and five, we almost did that at the committee level. That would be very easy to understand. Uh, and, fi and finally, the last report was uh, to recommend the council to use Paymentus for online payments. Uh, occasionally, there are, have been an increasing number of requests from businesses, individuals in the community to pay uh, taxes, water bills, uh, using credit cards. Uh, that comes with a transaction fee and the city ratepayer is not about to begin to absorb uh, the 2.1% so that people can build up air miles. Uh, so pay Mantis, what they do, if you choose to pay your, your taxes with your visa, that 2.1% will be borne by the cardholder, not the city. Uh, not the city uh, operate, operating budget. Uh, so we already allow for, you know, bank automatic withdrawal. That's all going to be the same. There's no changes there. This is just an additional service for some in the community that have been asking for it, and they will pay the cost. And with that, I would ask for acceptance and approval of those recommendations contained within. Thank you, Worship. Uh, sales were down on for fuel at the airport due to the 14 no fly days in October, and the new restaurant is now open as well. Uh, Chris Webb gave us gave committee a play-by-play -play of a drove video of the Kenny Drain stormwater management pond. Um, maybe if council had an interest, we could arrange a showing at council at a council meeting. I actually found it quite fascinating. Uh, committee received a report regarding bus loading and unloading at the Onsan District Secondary School on 9th Street West. Unloading in the morning is going well, but there's lots of congestion at the end of the day for students' school bus pickup. Committee has concerns over the amount of staff time, staff time being delegated to this issue. We recommended that staff follow up with the school board over the next four months in order to have a school board solution implemented prior to September of 2019. We've asked for a report by the end of April 2019. 
As we all know, it was a school board decision to combine the two high schools. If there is congestion issues, it should be the responsibility of the school board to decide which is the safest alternative for school bus loading and unloading. And finally, we had a report on the next steps in the backflow prevention program. This is a rather expensive task and staff was asked uh, which other municipalities are investing in this and asked to inquire about whether liability will decrease if such a program is put in place. This will be discussed in detail, I'm sure, during budget meetings. And with that, I move approval of the operation minutes. Thanks, everybody. I have a question. Uh, would Chair O'Leary uh, be interested in dealing with item 8D separate. My, my question is, I would move to postpone that particular item to the January meeting when the attached report could come forward because that was a greater than $2 million expense. And while I am very prepared to defend my position on it tonight, I just think that for the benefit of council, they should have that report with with that item um, but the we're not really approving we're not approving any major moves this is just the next steps correct so I'm not thank you your chair that's correct this will be coming forward as part of the budgetary process at which time decisions can be made whether or not the allotment is for approximately four hundred thousand dollars a year for the next five years at such time council can even decide whether or not they want to reduce the scope in terms of how much is spent on an annual basis It so was I, accepting the report and moving forward with the recommendation contained therein. And because of that, I think it should come back to council as a separate item with the report attached for the benefit of, of a fulsome discussion. Because there was, I mean, we received it, but there's, there's just to receive it for information purposes. That's not what happened. It was received with direction. Go to uh, Councillor Thomas. It was certainly clear to me in the meeting that uh, in approving this, all we were doing was moving it forward so that staff could actually make the uh, pitch at budget time to have this program funded and that we would be able to discuss it as a full council at that time whether we want to fund it or not and go ahead. Staff is indicating uh, yes, that's their understanding. So, If I could, Your Worship, absolutely. This is a big decision. All of Council will be informed on the magnitude of, of the risks and the costs with this program moving ahead. At budget time, we will certainly set aside the required time for it to be fully discussed. Right. So I, I think we'll just move the minutes the way they are and, and, uh, and carry on and, and have the debate at, at budget time. Councillor Kepke. Just to point out, the motion says accept the report. It doesn't say approve the report. So accepting is like receiving. Okay. So we're going to call the question. All in favor? That is carried. Uh, minutes of the Tom Thompson Art Gallery Advisory Committee. Thanks, Your Worship. I'm sure glad to see we've got lots of time left here tonight because uh, one of the first items we dealt with was uh, a report that we're calling the Tom Thompson Art Gallery, Where To From Here. Uh, it's only about eight pages long, so with Council's endorsement, I'll maybe postpone it till our next meeting and talk about it then. Uh, but it was, uh, did involve a survey of uh, up to 100 uh, people uh, currently and formally involved with the Tom Thompson Gallery as we uh, continue moving forward trying to uh, determine uh, new directions for the gallery as we move forward. And I will bring that back at the next meeting uh, in other business if, uh, if Council would like to hear about it. We did uh, finally get around to uh, passing a report creating three, uh, three subcommittees of the advisory committee, one for memberships, one for volunteers, and one for fundraising. So I'd like to invite any community member who has an interest in the gallery to please get in touch. Uh, 519-376-1932 and uh, we'll be happy to get you onto one of those committees uh, to help the gallery move forward uh, into the future. The last thing I'd like to mention, uh, we did hear a mention earlier about the big goalie mask and uh, the Saving Face Art in Front of the Hockey Net opening had 175 people at it, which is uh, one of the biggest openings in recent memory and 
I can almost guarantee you that between 70 and 80 percent of those people had never been in the gallery. So from our perspective as an advisory committee, uh, that was certainly what we were hoping for moving through with the exhibit and uh, it was a great success and staff deserve all of the credit on that one. We got uh, provincial news media coverage, we had people coming from all over Ontario and a great partnership uh, with the Owen Sound Attack in terms of bringing people into the exhibit. Uh, and with that, I would move, uh, we accept that report, Your Worship. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. So that gets us through all of 14 and all the reports. Matters postponed, we have none. Matters for which notice was previously given at number 16, we have none. Discussion of additional uh, business, back to you, uh, Councillor Thomas. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, my question just uh, revolves around uh, the November 21st special meeting of the DIA, and uh, we've certainly heard lots about that. It is yet to come to Council, and I know that we will be having a discussion of the proposal and the survey results and the vote uh, when, it, when the memorandum of, blah, blah, memorandum of understanding comes forward at uh, budget time. And something that I would like to see prior to that happening would be a legal opinion from the city solicitor on the legalities surrounding the uh, the memorandum of understanding at what is proposed here. Okay, so is that a motion? Do we need a motion for that? I, I have that opinion, Your Worship. So you'll share that with us when it comes? Certainly will. Thank you. Okay, good, thank you. Is there a second item? No, that was it. Okay, for me, it's just uh, a year-end already. We kind of did more of the year-end uh, on November 17th when it was end of the uh, council term. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the details, but we've had an interesting year in Owen Sound. Um, from successful things to uh, a loss or announced loss of uh, an industry that will scramble and uh, hope to get people working. Um, so much to do over the holidays from just hit on the uh, the goalie uh, mass show is pretty impressive at the art gallery uh, saving face order of good cheer skating rink will be back up and running as soon as it gets cold at Harrison Park festival of northern lights is uh, I think one of the best ones in years it looks really impressive uh, at Harrison Park there's the what do they call it the tunnel that you drive through that uh, is looking good uh, downtown, we're just talking, uh, we have beyond just the uh, Tom Thompson Art Gallery, we've got seven other art galleries and studios, uh, and that includes the co-op and uh, lots of different um, galleries and things to do, different stores downtown to uh, go shopping. Uh, we'll be hosting, the city will be hosting the family New Year's Eve at the Julie MacArthur Recreational Rec Center. Obviously on New Year's Eve it will be early in the evening, so it's family-oriented, and I think the balloons drop at 8 again. Your Worship, I'm guessing a little bit. I think it starts at 4, balloon drop at 7 or 7.30. 7.30, so well, you really need to be there by 6.30 just in case to have lots of fun. Um, so, wishing everyone a Merry Christmas, everyone happy holidays, happy new year. Um, look after one another. We've got such a great history in our community of looking after each other uh, in bad times and even in good times we need to check on our neighbors. Please be responsible for yourselves uh, and your activities and think before you get behind the wheel. Wishing everyone a Merry Christmas. Number 18. Moved by myself that the Committee of the Whole rise and report. All in favor? That's carried. 19. Moved by myself, uh, seconded by Councillor Kepke, that the action taken in Committee of the Whole in considering public meetings, deputations, and presentations, public question period, matters arising from correspondence, reports of city staff, consent agenda, committee minutes, matters postponed, motions for which notice was previously given, and additional business be confirmed by this Council. Thank you all in favor. That is carried. Are there any notices of motion to be given? Seeing none, I'm just going to get you to hold on for a second, uh, Councillor Hamley, while we got to get the uh, bylaws uh, presented. 
Through your worship, the bylaws listed for approval on tonight's agenda include the confirmatory bylaw, a bylaw to execute a boundary agreement with Georgian Bluffs, a bylaw to execute a site plan agreement with Rogers for property at 904 9th Ave East, a bylaw to amend the traffic bylaw to provide a barrier free parking stall on the west side of 1st Avenue East, south of 12th Street East, two lease agreement amendments with the Ministry of Transportation, one for Sound Street Beach and one for 10th Street Bridge Walkway. A bylaw to execute a release of agreement respecting property at 2280 20th Ave East. A bylaw to adopt the alternate member of County Council policy. A bylaw to appoint a member of Council to act in place of the Mayor and Deputy Mayor. A bylaw to execute an amended facility use agreement with Active Lifestyle Senior Centre for Use of the Bayshore. And a bylaw to execute a site plan agreement with 1799 20th Street East incorporated for property at 1875 16th Ave East. Good, thank you. Councillor Hamlin. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Kepke, that bylaw numbers 2018-158 through 2018-168 inclusive be passed and enacted. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. That completes our uh, business for tonight. Business for the year. It's uh, 9.50. Good night, everybody. Thanks.